that's gonna kind of mess with the recording. But so what we did is we took the uh, we took the function that was uh, responsible for heart bleed. Technically, there are two. It looks like. Um, so we took this function, uh, DTLS1 process heartbeat. This is the one that was modified. I think it was like right here. They put a bounce check in. So this is kind of the function in question. And we took it out and we just kind of isolated it from all of its components. We only implemented the structure elements that are needed uh, for that function to work. And we have it now building for um, 6502. In this case, it's it's not happy about these unused parameters. So let's just do, uh, I think it's uh, this. Um, statement has no effect. Yeah, that's the point. Um, I forget the correct way in C to uh, quote unquote use a parameter. Okay. So as long as we pass null to here, then we can call that function and we're we're doing the, the process heartbeat. So let's take a look. So I have a technique uh, attribute used. Do you use that on the each field? Like here. Whoa. Oh, you know what? That's a, I think that's a, that's definitely a GCC thing. That's not gonna port. Okay, so we have DTLS1 uh, write bytes. Uh, yeah, there's a, hmm. I don't know, we can just ignore those warnings. It's, it's kind of annoying. Um, unused parameter. Like Windows has on reference parameter. Let me see if there's a, a, I know there's like a common way. I thought it was just like put void out front, but I, maybe this compiler has just different warning sets. Um, see how to suppress them. Unused. Yeah, that's just void. Yeah, that's what I was trying. Or you just do like void on the type. And it just, it. this compiler doesn't even think that's valid. which is strange. I wonder if I can turn that warning off because that's just going to be annoying. Uh, CL65, Oop. H, warning. Okay, so press compiler warnings. I'm guessing probably unused, but I don't actually have the list of those, so I'm just gonna have to hope that it's uh, W. Um, suppress compiler warnings on used. Nope. Hopefully they have a help flag on that. Help. Hmm. Where would I go find that? Feature, list bytes, object. Hmm. Maybe verbose. Maybe verbose will tell us what warning that is. And like a more internal name of it. Um. No. That's kind of annoying. Like, maybe it's like unused parameter. Taking shots in the dark here. Yeah. Um, CL65 unused parameter. I feel like there's just not going to be a community for this. Ooh. Aha! There it is. Done. Unused param. Oh, we were so close. Well, it doesn't seem to work. Learn about unused function parameters. Parameters never used. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. 
enabled or disabled. Oh, to disable it's prefixed with a minus. Hey! We got there. <laughs> All right, sweet. Nice. Okay. So, um, the one of the things that I want to do is I want to get... So, this is built. This should be ready to fuzz. Uh, we pulled in everything malloc and free. We just kind of made do, like, those things. Um, ran pseudo bytes. We just mem set with 41. That's fine. This write bytes, we just make sure that we consume the buffer um, by just reading each byte in that in length. Uh, stop timer didn't look like it did anything relevant, so we just kind of commented that out. That's uh, it's a risk, but you never know. Um, and then these message callbacks we just disabled by uh, getting by commenting them out. I might actually add those in because it it never hurts to have things like that. Man, the, the indenting. How do people write? <laughs> this open SSL kit is <sighs> questionable. Um, so one of the things that I want to do, I want to go on a, a small tangent, and I want to get symbols working such that I can apply symbols here. And I should be able to load uh, like a debug, yeah, a debug file here. Um, and I think, is there a way for me to load a sim file? dbg file, I don't know if that tool can output. Let's see what this tool can output for uh, symbols. Because I'd like to be able to see a little bit better in the assembly what's what's happening. So, uh, findster i debug. So, add debug info is dash g. What's that going to do? What's that going to do? I don't think that'll affect the actual binary. Um, maybe in the .o file? So we'll put a dash g out front. We'll see what happens. Okay, so that made the .o file significantly larger. Um, the PRG is the same. And this also had an increased uh, .o file size. I'm curious if I can link this to an elf. Oops. If I can link this to an elf, I can just have like a debug version of it. Um, include source to comment, code size, code labels. Link this library, okay. Uh, specify a path. Hmm. Add source. Assembler listing file. I could look at the uh, linker side of things. I think they called it LD65. This I can pass in. Can I pass in an object type? A debug file. Generate debug information there okay and that wasn't an option here uh nope so we need to look at the cl65 this has a way of importing uh a linker arg or using a linker arg so we'll do cl65 ld args okay so let's see what this does ld args debug file uh, foop.dbg. Um, maybe I need quotes here. I don't know if quotes are going to work in this make file context. Unknown command. Maybe I can do equals. Hmm. We can invoke them separately. Ah, keep using the wrong one. Uh, LD65 star.o. Okay, so it doesn't have wildcard support. That's fine. Test.o and test main.o. Memory configuration missing. Dash dash CFG path. Uh, dash C. Okay. Uh, 
okay. That's because it's, it's probably linking with like a standard library. In LD, you use comma. We can try that, but this is uh, like on these commas here. I don't, this is a completely different linker. Oh, I guess it, I guess it works. Sweet. Oh, sweet. Nice. Is this an actual DBG file format? Or is that a custom one? Come on. Thanks for the comma suggestion. That's awesome. Debug. CSIM. Man, I have I have no idea if this is the right file format, but we'll just uh, we'll throw it in there and see what happens. I guess that's the that's what we can do, but I don't think it is. I think uh, DBG files are dwarves. Um, it'd be nice if this just works. Six five zero two. Load at these addresses. Then let's try and load up the debug file. Yeah. Yeah. I could write a parser for this. I don't I don't think Ida supports this out of the box. We've got all the lines. We've got sim uh symbol the value this so this is the address of it. Um, yep, there's entry, BSS size, so things with values, we just put a label, or type equals label, I guess. I think anything val equals, we can get the name and just uh, apply those. So boolean equal, okay. Yeah, we'll write, a, we'll write a parser for this quick. That shouldn't be too hard. Uh, we'll write a simparse.py. I could even make like a loader script for Ida that would just kind of do everything. I'm gonna assume that name always comes before value. That seems to be the case. So, and then the value is gonna be the address and uh, that one's val ox1 C cbm, okay. So some of these will just fail, that's fine. So we'll make import re um, parser is equal to re.compile. We'll look for a name look for a name uh, it's not gonna like that in this version name equals and then I think we can just do a, a greedy or a, a non greedy any value followed by a closing quote and then we're gonna eat everything until a value equals OX and then we'll parse out the 0 through 9 a through F capital more than one or more of those. We'll put this in a group and we'll put this in a group. It's probably ballpark. We'll, we'll try this. Um, open foop.debug rb.read part uh, for match in parser. Dot. I can do a find all here. Do Python sim parse. Uh, make that non bytes. Okay. Uh, wow. Well, that worked. Nice. First try. That looks good. And I don't think it missed anything either. Okay. So now uh, we just need to apply that address. So in Ida, we need to make a, uh, I think it's make name. Name. Make name. Oops. Name. Set name. Uh, fails if it contains invalid characters. Okay. So set name 
at a address. So we'll get uh, match one, and this will be convert it to a actual integer. And then we'll give it the name, which will be match zero. Um, applying symbol quote percent s to ox percent x. And we'll do uh, we'll do adder here and name here. So we'll actually uh, clean this up. Match zero. Comment that out temporarily. Applying symbol name to adder. Okay. Um, we're going to do this. We're going to switch it around, and then we're going to put uh, dot four x. This will make it uh, line up better. I like when things line up like this. Makes it a little bit easier to read. Okay, so now we have that. And we could also make a, a loader for a custom file format so we don't have to manually like set the base address anymore. And we could just go and uh, kind of just have that automatic automatically work. Let's see. So turn on that set name. And then this, we just need, uh, we need the path. And what's the best way to do that? This. Input is equal to that. Uh, we'll call it um, symbols.dbg.read and find all on those. Okay. And we'll change our build script, which we probably have like 10 copies open. We're going to name this uh, symbols.debug. Up and make okay nice so this will hopefully in improve our quality of life we're gonna pop this into ida we're gonna see if this uh loads up as we would expect and we need that script file as well sim parse Doop. test program 6502 i don't know how hard it is to add file formats to ida but i could i could try and look into doing that Simparse, applying symbol. Oh, look at that. Yep, there's our entry routine. And here it's going to call process heartbeat. Oh, we didn't get symbols on these. These are like all the libc functions. Hmm. I'm going to want symbols for a lot of these things. So here we have some loop labels. Or some, yeah. Here we have a call to malloc and then malloc here. But I want, I want some... Uh, I want some symbols on these, and to do to do that, maybe we have to build CL65, um, or we could maybe link with a debug version. We pass in dash G. It's possible this is only going to generate debug symbols for the... Mm, yeah, that might only make debug symbols for our application and not uh, the libraries that it's linked with. So let's... Maybe CC65 ships with that lib so i'm guessing these are the libraries that we'd link with target okay those are like drivers okay uh, search for debug debug disasm okay so that's not gonna cut it uh hmm I'm guessing it's because that ends up linking with a library, and I'm not sure what library that ends up using. We're building for... We didn't even set a target system. Somewhere in here, there must be a lib. None. We're probably linking with none. And is that going to be a zip? No. Okay, I might want to build this none.lib. And see if I can get that to like get the symbols going. So let's see. CC65. Lib source. None. 
We don't even have a CRT zero. I guess it's pulling in deck AX. I think these might be the functions that we're seeing. Procedure that. Is there a make file for these? Call. Yep. Yeah, I'm guessing these are probably what's being used. Like an add here. LDX, CLC, low byte, okay. Hmm. I'd really like to get those symbols. What's debug? Okay, this is for actually de debugging the compiler, I think, in this case. Um, let me just Google it. See if there's, uh, see if there's something that just uh, debug mode, add debug info to the object file. Um, debug output each optimization step. Yep, we don't care. That into the generated assembler code. It will cause the assembler to include all symbols in a special section of the object file. So I need to build those somehow. And this is a... This is a Linux make file, but let's let's see what happens if we just uh, whistle into there, or we'll go into there first and make CA sixty five. Uh, let's get that in our path. Uh, CC sixty five. We could just try and build it. Um, Read me make. I'm guessing just make is probably good enough here. It's a small enough project that I'm not going to try it with multiple jobs. I don't, uh, building things with multiple jobs typically uh, causes some issues. So this is building now the compiler. I'm guessing this would work with multiple jobs. Uh, linking. I'm looking for basically where it starts building actual uh, things with the compilers that it's making. But so far, looks pretty straightforward. Uh, GCC. Okay, now it's making all of the runtimes. Okay, uh, build. Let's see if there are any debug options for building it. Intro, coding, customizing, debug, debug programs. Yep. Use the G switch. Use it when invoking the compiler. Use the label file. Okay. Uh, use that in your source. G switch on the assembler command line. Yeah, I think when it goes through to build all these things, um, let me see. I think this is using, yep, that's using the actual build process here. So we can maybe get a G flag whacked into all of these uh, invocations, maybe. Debug info on. Let's see, customizing. Yeah, it's straightforward. Custom, ooh, adding custom instructions. Oh, that's kind of cool. Huh. Uh, Disk.io, function reference, overview of, okay. Hmm. Target specifics. Debug. I want debug stuff here. Okay. Well, we know that's gonna build. Everything's gonna work. Let's try uh, make J16. See if that. Uh, see if it works threaded. Looks like it does. That's always good to see. Wow, there's a lot of stuff in here. Okay, nice. 
So that built everything. Okay, so I should be able to... Is there none in here? Make none? Yeah. Make... Okay. So I should be able to go into... Make file. Let's see where that none path is. That's going to be in the... Uh, lib source. None. Maybe in runtime. Runtime might be the only thing that I need. I'm not sure. Let's see if I can build. I want to build with... Um, I want like a, a don't include any libraries in here. Like no default libraries. Verbose mode. Stop it for pre-processing. Oh, create a vice label file. Maybe that's what I want. Let me, uh, let's see what that does. Um, dash ln test dot labels. Is that everything? Oh, ah, uh, I think that is everything. Is that? It, it's definitely more than... Okay, let's see if there's one of these symbols gets resolved. So we've got like this uh, 2424 AC. Two four AC. Yeah, okay. All right, that'll do. <laughs> we can just use that then. Uh, we'll get rid of this. Uh, Test.labels. Okay, we'll call this like debug.labels and make. Okay, now we have to change our parser to parse this file format. Oh no, the horror. Uh, AL. I think that's fine. We're going to search for uh, AL, or we're going to search for the start. We're going to make kind of a strict parser here. OS path file. Okay, that should work. And then this will take in a debug.labels and we should have a value I'm guessing it's always six so I'm gonna just hard code a six in here it's just nine eight through F capital and then we have the remaining part of this string is that a L followed by that now we flip these around. What do we call this? Uh, Simpers. Oops. Uh, import OS. Okay. Uh, maybe our regex is too strict here. Applying symbol for those. And there we go. Did it really not like the these? Oh, it's probably some multi-line stuff, so that makes sense. But this looks good. We're gonna find until the end, and I guess if we yeah, if we have non-greedy, it doesn't work. So this looks fine to me. Put the set name back in and just update these files. So we'll get rid of this and we'll take simparse and debug labels and our test program, which hasn't changed in this case. And now we should have full symbols, hopefully. Uh, simparse, there we go, that looks good. And foop.debug we can get rid of. Oh, I don't close that file, do I? <laughs> okay. Sweet. So now everything should be labeled. We have process heartbeat. We have all these things. So push AX. Okay. Load AX YSP. Um, load AX YSP. Okay. Push AX. Yeah, this is the life now. <laughs> Much better. Okay. Open SSL malloc. Okay, now now we won't be guessing when we're uh, writing stuff here. So we're going to have our fuzzer, uh, st we're going to load our file, and we're just going to point, um, I think we have everything set up the way we want. 
So I'm going to point... Uh, what does this take for arguments? AX. Okay, so we're going to just jump directly into process heartbeat. So we're going to start closing some of these files. Make some room here. Uh, don't need those open anymore. Okay, so when we go to create our master VM up in here... Uh, traditionally, we had it jump to the load base, but in this case, we're going to have it jump directly into the function. Um, and this is jump to um, set PC to start from load heartbeat. And then we just need to set up the... This is probably going to crash with like a null DRF, or I guess, I guess null DRFs don't really exist. Um... Right force, yeah, it doesn't like these things on the fuzz side of things. Uh, we'll keep these mutation strategies because they're uh, probably uh, probably as good as we need. So really the only issue is injecting those. So we're going to comment out the injection of those inputs into the target uh, temporarily. Okay. Nice. Crash accessing that. Um... And I'm guessing that it's it that's gonna be crashing like right away. Um, it's probably the earliest occurrence because we're we're passing null. Uh, so what I need to do is I need to load up X A and X, and we're gonna set those up in the master. So we'll set up the if I do four one four one this should crash, or we'll do like C one C one, A and X right. I can't remember which one's the high order byte and which one's the low order byte. I think I can steal that from here. Um, it is, the high part is in X. So if I do an, this is the high part. And this is the pointer to the SSL context structure. So I just want to see if this is crashing yeah, it's, it's trying to access F1C2. If we, um, that's going to be one byte into it, F1C2. Um, okay, so right away, yep. LDY, okay. Cool. That's kind of exactly what I expected. So now we need to set this up to point to some memory. Um, so we need to allocate, we're going to allocate our input buffer um, for, or we're actually going to allocate our structure for this function. And in this case, it takes in a, um, this takes in a, I guess we can look at our version. This takes in, uh, an SSL structure. So I just need to get the size of that structure. It looks like, well, that's a pointer. So two, three, four, five, six bytes. So we need a six byte thing that we pass in. So um, allocate a, we're going to allocate a SSL structure and we'll make it six bytes. Uh, we'll put this at, uh, we'll put this at F zero zero zero. We'll add six bytes of memory there. Dot right force. Do I have online? I do at vert adder OXF OO. Um, actually, we'll do set permissions. So we're going to set the permissions on that structure to uh, write and read after write. And we'll assert that this is equal to 6. Uh, and I need a length here, don't I? Uh, here. So we'll set the permissions on that memory to... Uh, writable and then read after write. So if something actually fills in a field there, then we don't have to worry about... Um, if something actually goes to fill in a field... Okay, and that's simparse. Don't need that open. That will keep... Okay. So that's crashing, accessing F1C2, of course. We know that this should be at F O O O, and this is the low part. Um, set up a pointer to the SSL structure.
Okay. Uh, crash accessing that. It means that it's uh, doing a read access on that field at one. It's probably reading the bytes one by one. So the next, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be deref'ing the first field, this S3 field, which is a pointer to a, um one of these things, which has one R record. So that's the same as just pointing directly to this, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 14 plus eight, 22, 22 bytes. So we're gonna allocate a, um, for this, we're gonna allocate one of these structures, allocate a, this structure. I think I said 22 bytes. We're going to put this at D, just so it's nice and spaced out. And then we're going to set up the SSL structure, uh, set up the SSL, um, what is this pointer? SSL S3 to point to the record. So we'll do vm.mmu.writeForce. Uh, online vert adder OXDOO, and then we're going to write in a pointer. In this case, it's just going to be an OX. Uh, we're writing to FO DOU16. Okay, so we're going to write in that field. So now it will have a pointer to that next part of the structure. Um, I think write force might not update the raw bit, so we'll just do a write. Okay, so now we have a crash accessing D007. That's fine. That's going to be the next pointer that it accesses. Or accesses. Um, so we're just going to fill in that field. So with this kind of like uninitialized memory use tracking stuff, it allows me to uh, go through and um, it allows me to like implement these things incrementally. Uh, I call this gauge fuzzing, which is like just the stupid name that I called to refer to like what I'm doing right now. Uh, what's really amazing about this technique and way of fuzzing, uh, obviously it's very labor intensive, but this means I can take an like an iOS ROM or a dump and I can just set execution to the start of a function and then I can lazily fill in the fields as I see they're accessed. Obviously this is the field it's accessing, this data field. So we're going to make uh, the final thing here in data, pointer to the record data. And so we're going to make the um, allocate, uh, allocate room for our data. And we're going to put this at uh, E. And we'll just do 16 bytes. Allocate room for our data. And then we're going to point, uh, set up the S3 data field and we know that that is a fixed pointer at e and we don't we want to write two bytes at oxeo um or do plus wherever we're crashing um seven so six let's double check ah um if you take a look at this it's uh zero two Four, six. So now we filled in that data pointer. So um, that is good. And if it accesses any byte in the structure that we don't initialize, we'll see a very clean crash. So in this case, we see it's accessing, um, it's trying to actually read from that data buffer. So it's executing, um, it's, trying to, it's trying to read that first byte. So in this case, it's going to be dereffing P here. So this is where we're currently executing. Um, read type and payload length. So there's a type here, and then this, uh, C tags are dot, okay. So this is just a, this is consuming, uh, network, uh, this is just reading a short from a packet and then advancing the, uh, packet pointer. So, Basically, this needs to always have. Wow, does it not check the length at all here? No way. No way. 
This is like really broken. <laughs> okay. N2S, so we're gonna, it's gonna start with a type, um, HB type, and then it has a two byte length field, N2S. Um, I don't know if that needs to be accurate. So I don't know if that's trusted or untrusted data. Um, I mean, if that's trusted data, that's really broken because this function never accesses a length field. Let's check out uh, open SSL open um, BSD uh, heartbleed patch. That's like really broken. Um, I just, okay. No, I don't, I don't want this. I want, uh, I want the patches. Okay. I have been released. Blah, blah, blah. Where can I find them? Come on, where's this patch at? What's the best way to get this? Uh, uh, Heart bleed open SSL patch diff. Okay, yeah. Oh, wow. Like this. F <laughs> that is, that is incredible. So if we look at this REC structure here, uh, we'll see that there is a um, a data pointer here, which is uh, basically the record data. I'm guessing that's completely untrusted. And then the length, which is the size of this data field. Um, and if we look at this function, it doesn't actually ever check the length at all. Like here, it's this is for a callback, but the callback is not being used in the default case. Whenever you're auditing code and you see callbacks, it's usually pretty safe to assume that they're probably only there for hooks or like custom configurations. Obviously double check it because you never know in your target if those are being used, but traditionally callbacks are never used. So in this case, uh, it never checks a length ever in this function. It never checks the trusted length. So if we see what the patch does, it actually makes sure that there's room for one plus two bytes. That's for the, um, the type and the payload length. So in this case, like, this is finding Heartbleed. Like, this is Heartbleed right here. Like, this is finding Heartbleed uh, 53 million times a second. Because it, it's so... Like, it's just always wrong. If, if you have this... If this record... If, this, if the length of this data is zero, um, this is just always reading out of bounds. It never checks. And if we look at the patch, what the patch did is instead of derefing a pointer to get a one byte type field and then derefing that again to get a 16 bit field, um, instead they added a check to make sure there's at least this much room in that buffer using the trusted REC length, which in this case it doesn't use at all. This entire function doesn't, doesn't check the length. Wow, what a what a bug. Um, okay, so and then it computes this like length for the malloc, and it allocates the correct amount of room. So let's. So I mean that's heartbleed right there. Is uh, I mean, it's pretty hard to get this to even never crash. I mean obviously if you have a, if you don't have a strict allocator, that's just going to go out of bounds in the heap. And this is probably rarely going to crash because like this is just one byte out of bounds. This is now up to three bytes out of bounds. Um, and I'm sure this is just going to keep grabbing stuff off pointer. Um, like it's probably going to use this length here, this N to S. Uh, it then probably uses PL. It probably does PL minus P to get the length. It does a mem copy of that for payload bytes and payload in this case um, oh, that loads it into S. Okay, so payload is an untrusted length from the network. It does a malloc based on that. Um, it then writes those bytes out to this, uh, it writes out the payload to this new BP, this allocated buffer, um, and it advances that pointer, and it copies it out, adds this random padding. 
So pretty much everything is wrong here because it doesn't check a length <laughs> at all. So I, I was kind of expecting this to like require fuzzing. I didn't realize that this was just fundamentally always wrong. Um, so maybe, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll pick another thing to fuzz. Because, <laughs> yeah, there you go. This is, uh, this is Heartbleed being found uh, uh, 56 million times a second. <laughs> in fact if if we take a look actually at this um god that's unreal like it doesn't even read the length field we don't even see an axis of the length field because it doesn't even happen um god. wow 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 that is insane. Okay. All right, let's uh, let's get coverage going and let's take a look at our coverage. And here's our coverage. So we're gonna go and process that heartbeat message and then execution never makes it past this function because, uh, because this axis is always wrong. In this case, my fuzzer will never let it continue execution beyond here because it's always wrong. It's always wrong. <laughs> um, Unreal, unreal, unreal. Okay, so let's theoretically populate it correctly and, and just see if it crashes in other places in the function. So bugs typically kind of propagate and grow and expand and get worse as uh, like once one bug has happened, that now starts violating the assumptions of the entire application. And now a lot of things in the application start going awry. You see this a lot with like heap corruption of like you end up corrupting something and now everything is broken. Um, so let's take a look at, so the field we wanna fill in, so that's the data field. We fill in a pointer there and the pointer um, is based on like this size here. So, uh, in our fuzz routine, we're gonna dynamically tweak the length of that and fill it into the um, uh, to that structure. So we're gonna compute kind of a random length. Right now, we're just gonna set it to 16. This is uh, set the permissions on the input buffer. And then we're also going to fill in the length, uh, fill in the length. And in this case, we'll use the mutate input length. Um, okay. And we'll grab this, we'll make sure it's equal to this. And then we're gonna fill in the length here. And that's gonna be at, it's gonna be right next to the pointer, uh, which is here. What, a, what, what code? Set up the, um, set up the S3. <laughs> um, our rec length. Obviously it's not using it, so we don't actually have to fill this in, but it's nice to like, it's nice to implement how it should work, um, just so we have a better idea. So this is at offset two in this structure. So we're gonna write this in to D2. We're gonna write in the length, uh, mutate input dot len as u size. And we're gonna make sure that's two bytes, which it always should be, um, or as a u16. So set up the uh, length field. So we set the permissions of the input buffer for the correct size. Um, and first we want to like unset the permission. So we'll set the permissions to zero for the full size. So we'll do a, a const max input size, u size, we'll say 256. Actually we'll say uh, like 64. I think 256 is a bit overkill. When we go to create that uh, data here, we're gonna allocate, we're gonna add memory for that uh, for max input size. And then down here, we're going to for max input size, we're going to unset permissions. So we're gonna basically disable all accesses to the input buffer, and then enable accesses to the input buffer for just the size of the input. And we'll do uh, perm write there and perm read. And then we'll put in a, we'll actually write in that input buffer. So we'll write vm.mmu uh, write force into here, so this is gonna be populate the input buffer. And in this case, we're going to write, um, 
mutate input uh, as slice. And we don't need to give it a length. And we don't need permissions here. So we'll make sure that the whole thing succeeded in writing it out. And then we'll set up the length field to be the actual length of that input buffer. Obviously, we're still going to have uh, crashes everywhere, um, right? Force. Um, that one should be actually a right. Uh, what's it complaining about? Expected three parameters. And we give it, I'm pretty sure we're giving it three parameters here. Um, 305, VMMU write. Oh, I didn't have a comma. Woo. Okay. So we don't need pointer and length here. And then the mutate input we'll set to, uh, this should actually fail in in my fuzzer. It will probably panic here. Um, okay. So now we're gonna go to max input size down here and we're gonna do, uh, when we're generating, We'll go up to this inclusive. So we're going to create a new input of zero to max input size bytes inclusive. Um, it'll start out at zero, and then we'll kind of munch that. We'll make sure that the length is always less than or equal to that. We'll set the permissions on the whole buffer to zero. Then we'll set the permissions for only the bytes that we're actually going to write in to read and write. We're then going to write in those bytes as the input. Uh, we'll set up the length field to be the correct uh, value there, and then we'll update uh, the fuzz input structures, and that's it. I think we're good. Can I make a Discord server? Ooh, I could. I could try and uh, set that up. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so here, here we're gonna see a bunch of crashes. Uh, these four axes are axes basically that are, um, whenever we see an E axis, this is probably a field that we don't fill in in our data structure. Or actually, this is an out of bounds axis of our input buffer. Um, obviously, they're all over the place. Um, so anything in the E with an EO prefix is an out of bounds axis of the input buffer. Um, obviously, we have a, a lot of those. Um, then if we look at the four zero, these are going to be out of bounds accesses on a heap. Let me check the permissions on these. Um, I'm guessing these are probably actually, these are probably reads. Let me, uh, crash at, uh, um, crash at, crash at this. And I want the reader, right? We'll throw this in here. Yeah, I'll set up a discord server. I'll, I'll do that in a second. Um, read or write, I think that would be a, a good way to communicate with people. So we're gonna say crash at crash the type, read or write. Okay, so now we'll get like a quote unquote classification of the crash type um, semicolon. Uh, if is right, right. Okay. So we have accessing 100. I actually don't know what that was. Oh, that's when it goes to return. So, um, but yeah, we've got a couple of write crashes here. Um, was there heap corruption in Heartbleed? I thought everyone thought Heartbleed was just a leak, but in this case, we are we are writing out of bounds on allocations. Um, So this 100 here, I think this is the return because I don't give a return address. Yep, that's at return. So that's not our real crash because um, that's, that's returning up from the function and we don't, actually put, uh, we don't actually put anything on the stack there for it to return to. So we're just going to ignore that one. We're going to just keep that in our, our, in our head. Uh, I have no idea why this one's faulting. Um, this is loading at uh, OX107. I don't, I don't know what memory that's possibly accessing. Um, I don't know what would be causing that. 
1007. Okay. Then we have another crash. Uh, crashes are, are basically everywhere. We have a crash in our mem copy. We've got uh, a write crash when we're writing to a heat buffer. So I was under the impression that Heartbleed was only a read vulnerability. I did not know that there was a write aspect of it. Um, so, uh, let's take a look. So, obviously, we find Heartbleed and, like, a bunch of bugs in this function. Obviously, when you have a function that doesn't bounds check or check lengths of the trusted input, this is what you get. <laughs> Like, everything crashes because everything's broken. Everything is wrong in this function. Like, all the assumptions are violated. Um, so, yeah, we're seeing a lot of crashes. Um, pretty much everywhere in this function, there are bugs. Yeah, I thought Heartbleed was just read as well. Um, let's take a look. Uh, so, we have... We're, we're going to, first of all, out-of-bounds read on this payload into a type. We're going to do an out-of-bounds read to read the length. So... I don't know if this length is controlled by a user. And that might be that might be the bug that like this record, this data might not be entirely controlled. It could be a prepended header by something internal to SSL and thus it's not user controllable. But in theory, um, if this payload field, uh, this payload length was controlled, um, then this would do a, uh, ho, ho, ho. I, I think I know what's going on here. Um, so this is the payload length. We've got the padding. <laughs> I see. I think this, <laughs> so this is then going to do a copy. Um, so let's see how much it writes into buffer. So buffer, it doesn't use anywhere else except for uh, BP. So BP, it's going to write one byte there. There's room for that. It's going to write two more bytes. There's room for that. It's going to copy the payload in. There's room for that. And then it's also going to add the padding bytes. So this bug, Heartbleed, on a 16-bit architecture where, where Heartbleed is, uh, where an int is 16 bits, it is technically a write vulnerability because there's an integer overflow on the calculation for the malloc size. So if you set this to like FFFF, right, uh, it's a 16-bit read, but if my int, in this case, is two bytes, then this is actually an integer overflow, and that means that these are out-of-bounds writes to the heap. So on 6502, Heartbleed is actually uh, potentially remote code execution. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's kind of cool. Like it's a, it's a, it's a really obscure, it's a really obscure edge case. But uh, um, <laughs> I wonder, are there is? I'm curious if Open SSL even works on size of int uh, is two. Um, in in this situation, this this heartbleed is actually a memory corruption bug. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna get rid of some of these uh, uh, statistics prints just so I can have a, a slightly smaller terminal. Um, I'm just gonna comment these out temporarily, and actually I'm gonna put these on a new line. So we're gonna grab the stats here and I'll just print uh, the same thing but yeah so we learned something new about Heartbleed today <laughs> get your CV <laughs> oh, eh, that's just that's just too funny <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, let's see how bad this output's going to be. In 32, but there would be an... Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. I've had that feeling before.
But there we go. We, we, we can find Heartbleed in a second. So uh, that's nice. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to screenshot this. I don't know why my terminal is in this color. It's not supposed to be. Uh does reset work? Hey. I think it just got stuck there with like a control C. I've got a bunch of followers who who've joined up. Uh Boo boo blibu. Thank you for following. Nissan no X, thank you for following. And eight Atardov? Atardov? <laughs> thank you for following as well. I hope you guys are having a blast. This is uh Should we add some coloring? Should we add some like prettiness to, to our output? Spice it up a little bit. Make it look nice. We can make like the rights show up in red and like kind of do these things. Bang Pow subscribed with Twitch Prime. What's up? <laughs> Welcome back to the dead section of Twitch. Yeah, I you know, I I wanted to just change it up. I have to A-B test and see. Um, I actually looked at science and technology today and there's some girl who's doing like chemistry streaming. And I'm like, shit, that's cool. So maybe there are a couple people who do look through the uh, science and technology section. So I'm, I'm doing some A-B tests to see how much this changes things. Um, but who knows? Uh, I'm going to get a unique crash counter in here too. Um, let's do that. I think I can just do that from CrashDB's length. So um, 8 unique. And I put it in quotes because you can't, you can't, Uniqueify crashes without human intervention. It's it's like a it's like an NP hard problem. Dot uh, crash db dot len. In this case, they're they're only deduped by the address they're accessing. So hell yeah! <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> Let me get an uptime counter on here too. <laughs> Just because I can. <laughs> Elapsed here. All right. <laughs> oh. Okay. I'm just I'm just screen capping this for for some Twitter hype. Sorry, I, I I like I like a little bit of hype when we find some fun bugs. We'll just uh we'll go into Twitter and we'll do like uh we'll do like this. Uh, today I learned that Heartbleed is technically an RCE. Well, at least heap corruption on architectures where size of int is equal to two. Uh, learned <laughs> learned this the fun way by questioning my 6502 build of open SSL <laughs> for finding heart bleed. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll put that in backticks, not like Twitter formats it. <laughs> All right, there you go. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, that's nice. So yeah, in what what is that? In in uh, five seconds, we had fifty fifty three unique crashes. That's good. All right, so now I know that I could have found Heartbleed. Um, so. Uh, what do you guys want to fuzz next? I thought that was going to be like all day long. I thought that was going to be like a big deal. And we were going to like, oh, how does this work? How do we get all these libraries to like interleave and mix and and handle and everything to operate correctly? And it turns out, uh, well, that, that, wasn't, uh, that wasn't nearly as exciting as, uh, as I expected. Let, we can, uh, let's run this for just a, a minute or so. Feel free to ask questions or just hang out. Uh, Alexian, thank you for following. Jack4608, thank you for following as well. Hell yeah. Hell 
having having an absolute blast with this. This love seeing this. Uh, looks like coverage eventually kind of plateaus here. Uh, we can see roughly what our what our code coverage looks like. Explain explain my laughter. Um, are you familiar with Heartbleed? Is anyone not familiar with Heartbleed here or, or security ramifications kind of in that regard? Because we can, we can go down that path. We can talk about those things. Um, absolutely. <laughs> All right. So in this case, uh, basically what we've discovered, so yeah, Heartbleed, Heartbleed, uh, if you're not familiar with C, I'm going to I'm gonna grab the coverage. I just want to quickly see what the coverage is, is like. And then we're going to talk about Heartbleed and kind of the ramifications. So let's get our coverage all colored up in here. OK. So we can see what our coverage looks like in our uh, Heartbeat thing. Uh, in, this case, <laughs> in this case, we've never made it past here because it's always crashed. Um, otherwise, we probably would have ended up hitting these paths. Uh, and then I'm guessing we don't hit that path because we probably always crash out. Yeah, because this is going to load A0, and this is going to load A1. Since we never hit this path, we'll never go down this path. But we technically have, oh, we have, we're missing some coverage here. Uh, branch not equal on an A. Um, all right, our coverage isn't perfect. So... We would hit all of this if it didn't crash. So our our like protections are too strict, um, and it means it never actually makes it past this point because it's uh, I think it's just always incorrect, or we never generate a valid enough packet. Um, so Heartbleed, if you're not familiar with Heartbleed, Heartbleed was like honestly probably the first vulnerability that like got a website and hype and all these different things. Um, which some people disagree with, some people don't. Honestly, if you enjoy doing it, just fucking do it. Like, if you enjoy making a logo and making a write-up and, and trying to hype up your bug, if you enjoy it, then do it. That's part of the process of, of finding bugs. Like, if it makes you enjoy your work more, then do it. It's not hurting anyone. It looks kind of tacky. So, like, just be aware that it kind of looks silly and tacky. Um, but, like, <laughs> like, do it if it's fun. I, I like making logos for bugs. I actually buy stuffed animals for all my bugs that I find. I, I like, try to, like, concretize them in, like, real life by having, like, a, a trophy for them. Um, so, we've got Heartbleed here. And they kind of go into some details, but, like, all the shit is, like, stuff you don't care about. This is saying, like, okay, how does it work and, and whatever. Um, blah, blah, blah. Like, like who cares? This, this stuff's just boring. Um, it'll talk about, like, how to patch and, like, all the things that I don't necessarily care about. So we can look at the actual bug. So heartbleed in code is in this function here. Um, um, uh, not in that. Okay, let me, let me find the actual function. Uh, uh, in here. So we're going to go to this. So this is the function that was affected by Heartbleed. Technically, there is one other function as well that was affected by Heartbleed. Um, but I think this is like the primary one that everyone, everyone knows and loves this one. Um, Corsbo, thank you for following. Fire Extinguisher, love the name. Thank you for following. So in this case, uh, the things in question are this REC data points to, I don't know if it's completely user-controlled, but let's say it's, it's user-controlled data. Um, so this field points to a buffer that was allocated somewhere, whether it's on the heap or the stack, it was alloc allocated somewhere, put in this SSL context, and passed into this function. Now, this data uh, field has a corresponding, um, if we go look at the type for this uh, REC field, um, it's an SSL3 record, and this has data, which is a pointer to the record data, and then it also has a length field, which is the size of this data field, um, and an offset that kind of tells you like an offset into the buffer. Um, okay, so in this situation, there's actually no uses of the length 
in this case, this is a callback. This is like an optional thing. You would do this if you wanted to extend the functionality of this for your custom operating system or your, like, let's say you're writing this for a custom embedded device, you'd probably add like some callbacks here so you could potentially modify behaviors and get hooks into the internals of SSL. It's also helpful for debugging and, and a bunch of different things. So this is going to get the uh, P is going to point to user controlled data. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to deref P without checking a length. And like I mentioned, there's actually nothing in this function that checks the official length. So everything here is just wrong. So here, this is reading a byte. So if you're not familiar with C, uh, this is doing a deref. The asterisk, the asterisk uh, says to basically um, deref this pointer. So grab the byte that this address is. So like a pointer, if you're, if you're really not familiar with pointers or those sorts of things, pointers are basically addresses to memory. They tell you where in memory certain objects are. And in this case, it's going to get the address and it's going to then read one byte from that address. And then it's going to advance the pointer. So now P is going to point to the next byte. So it's going to kind of consume one byte from memory from that location. Um, then there's this helper function, this N2S. I'm guessing it's probably network to short. Um, there's two implementations. The one we care about is here. They, they do the same thing. Uh, but it's basically going to assign into the S parameter, the second parameter to this uh, macro. It's going to read two bytes from the input stream, and it's then going to uh, also update that pointer. So in this case, think of this as it's going to consume two bytes from pointer while advan or from P, and then it's going to advance P by two bytes, and it's going to read that field into payload, which is an unsigned int. Um, it's then going to set PL is equal to P, so it's going to log. Uh, it's basically like keeping track of where this pointer was. Uh, you'll see this a lot in parsing routines. It's kind of like a marker. It's like a placeholder for where it is. So already, this has read three bytes from a location that hasn't been verified to have those bytes there. Um, if the HB type is an HB request, then this stuff happens. Otherwise, if it's a response, this happens. This is the user controlled value. The HB type came from the first byte of this. Let's say it's a packet. It's technically not. It's like actually nested in the SSL state. But let's say like it's the first byte of a packet and that the user can switch between these kind of different states, whether it's a, a heartbeat request or a heartbeat response. In the case of a heartbeat response, we're going to then read another two bytes uh, from PL this time into the sequence number. We're then going to see if the sequence number matches some um, extended uh, HB sequence. And then if that's the case, it's going to update these sequence numbers. Uh, this is another two bytes out of bounds. But all of this is kind of just state tracking. But there's there's no bug here, actually. I mean, technically, this could like this function could then have bugs in it. But um, in this case, this looks fine. So what's interesting is up here, if it's an HB request, a heartbeat request, it's going to allocate one byte plus two bytes plus the payload size plus the padding size. So in this case, padding is actually fixed size, so 16. Payload is going to be a um, payload is controlled entirely by the user, and that is a two byte field. So that is controlled from um, depending on how this casting is done. It's read as um, unsigned ints. So in this case, oops, uh, I'm going to go back to that function. Um, so in this case, this field, this payload variable can be a value that is 16 bits in size that is fully controlled by the user. And in this case, it can be payload. Um, it can be, uh, it can be zero to uh, 65535 inclusive. And that is the same as FFFF in hexadecimal. Um, so that means that you can cause it to allocate more so you can like, you know, change the size of the allocation. So then what it's going to do is it's going to, after that allocation has created a new buffer, it's going to move that uh, buffer pointer into BP. So it can kind of index and like increment this BP pointer with not affecting the base allocation. 
In C, you typically need to keep the original allocation around. So you'll see a lot of things like this in parsers where they'll make a copy of a pointer so they can leave the original one alone. Um, so in this case, we're going to, uh, we're going to get a response type uh, length and copy the payload. So here it's putting in the response type. So it's writing in a response here. It's kind of the, it's, if it gets a request, then it constructs a response and sends it out. So it's the same format that we parsed up here. The first byte that it's going to write into here is going to be the response, uh, the response type. Then it's going to write in the size of the payload into BP, once again, as a network short. Then it's going to copy the payload into this, and it's going to advance this pointer by payload. So the, the one byte is going to be added, two bytes going to be added. So this is accounting for that little header, the type and the length. The payload is the size of the payload. And then the padding, of course, is the size of the padding. So in this case, it's actually uh, correct in, in most situations. Uh, however, the um, so all of these are out of bounds. And then uh, let's see. You can cause it. So the original heart bleed was due to um, what was the issue? Uh, oh yeah, because you could give a length and it would copy into this buffer and then send this back to you of that larger length. What we just discovered is that on certain architectures, which are really rare and probably OpenSSL isn't supported on them, uh, where the size of an int, which is this payload field, is, so an int traditionally, an int traditionally uh, is a 32-bit value which means it's four bytes, and it can hold a value between zero and OX, FF, 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 FF. You know, that's, uh, that's and this is like four billion something, uh, four billion, I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's that number. Four billion, blah, blah, blah. So what's interesting is that on a traditional system where this is the size of an int, is a, when an int is this, then you don't actually get full control of that int, and there's no way that you can take 16 plus um, 65,535 plus 1 plus 2 to overflow. However, when size of int is 16 bits, which is the case on 6502, uh, int is a 16-bit value, and that's the smallest size allowed by the C standard. Um, and int has to be at least always 16 bits. In this case, these two bytes, you actually control the length entirely. And if you're not familiar with unsigned arithmetic in C or really on, on hardware, um, what happens is when it overflows, it actually wraps that logic. So in this case, we're working with a word here, a 16-bit value. This is the size of an int. So let's say if we had a payload size of uh, 65,535... Uh, oh, this is only going to let me do... Um, that's only going to let me do signed. Uh, yeah, the calculator is not an unsigned calculator. Um, but effectively, if I, if I say that we have an allocation of FFFF bytes, and then I add the 1 and the 2 to it, it's actually now 0 because it wrapped around, and now it's 0, and add 2, and then add 16. So in this case, um, on an architecture where an int is 16 bits, this would malloc room to hold 18 hex bytes, but it would copy 65,535 bytes into that buffer, um, which is corruption. That's, uh, that's an actual, that would likely be an exploitable vulnerability, whereas Heartbleed traditionally allowed you to leak things out of bounds. Um, in this case, we're showing that on, uh, with this constraint, Technically, Heartbleed actually is remote code execution. You could corrupt the heap, and typically, as security researchers, if you can con corrupt the heap with contents you control, that's usually game over for the system. You'll maybe need an ASLR bypass. You'll need to understand how the heap works. You might have issues with heap cookies, but there's usually creative ways around all of these problems, um, especially when this is a leak itself. So you could use Heartbleed to leak the stat or to leak the heap 
to get access to some pointers, to get access to some heap cookies, and then you could use it as an attack to get arbitrary code execution on the machine. So I think this one bug is absolutely exploitable. The only way this won't be exploitable is if you never can get an allocation after this that is worth corrupting. But given you can go 64K out of bounds on a write, that's pretty, that's pretty busted. So yeah, is that a good explanation? Anyone have any questions on that? <laughs> Maybe compile some image decoders for, for the 6502 and claim that most of them crash because your int is two bytes. Oh yeah, everything's gonna break. Like, I'm not surprised. Well, I actually am kind of surprised here, but this is relatively common where you'll see a uh, promotion to an unsigned int from a short, especially with networks. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of protocol vulnerabilities on systems that have an int as a 16-bit value. Um, but it's cool that we found this. We were able to, we ran our fuzzer, and our fuzzer just told us that this existed, and then we, after the fact, went and figured out why this actually happened. Um, but yeah, 64K out of bounds right is absolutely game over, uh, especially when coupled with a... Um, especially when you couple that with a uh, read. So, but yeah, how cool is that? We, we literally, we, we learned something new about Heartbleed today. I'm sure someone had that in their mind when they thought about it. Maybe someone has talked about this before, um, but this might be the first occurrence of someone actually getting heap corruption in SSL using Heartbleed. So... I'm glad you all were here to enjoy it. Let's uh, let's find something else to fuzz. So at this point, like, there's really nothing more to go on Heartbleed. We we demonstrated we demonstrated that our our fuzzer can find Heartbleed almost instantaneously. Um, so <laughs> what are we gonna do? Uh, this is unrelated, but can you explain how cache lines work? Uh, from what I understand, if you load a pointer in C, it doesn't load just uh, 4 slash 8 bytes, but 64. Yes, absolutely. So um, let me uh, pull up a diagram. So we're going to look for uh, wiki chip uh, skylake architecture. So this is one of my favorite things to like have up when I'm discussing kind of CPU-related things. Um, so there's an amazing diagram here that kind of shows what's happening internally to the processor. So in this case, um, when you perform a load, it's going to go to these load ports. So um, let's talk about a CPU and like how a CPU works in, in modern day. So you have a lot of complex stuff going on, but we're going to kind of gloss over the, all these lines. It, it's pretty straightforward. So you have an L2 cache that can deliver 64 bytes per cycle to the instruction cache, the L1 instruction cache, which can then deliver 16 bytes per cycle to the instruction fetch and decode. And the instruction fetch and decode is what is reading the actual memory that is your code. It's reading the uh, assembly, technically the byte code, but it's, it's reading that assembly that got compiled from your compiler that you hand wrote, and it's converting those into these macro ops. And in the case of x86, macro ops look pretty much identical to instructions. Technically, they have some like um, compare and branch macro ops that fuse a compare and a branch branch together, um, and that will happen here in like macro fusion. Um, then these macro ops are delivered to the decode, and the decode is going to take your macro ops, basically the x86 instructions you know and it's going to convert them into micro ops. And internal, in, in like an Intel processor, it doesn't actually execute x86. It executes whatever architecture they're working on, and that's their micro architecture. Um, so it's basically a translator from x86 to their custom architecture, and that gives them freedom to change things up internal to the processor and, and radically redesign things uh, as they want. These are then going to go to these like allocation queues and renaming and reordering. We can talk about that, it's complex. Uh, but effectively, the UOPS will then get delivered to the scheduler, which is going to find where in the processor there is something that is not busy. 
Um, in the case of a load, it can be executed on two different load ports, the uh, port 2 and port 3. Um, so the scheduler, when it gets a load operation, like a, a DREF, it's going to try to figure out, can is port 2 or 3 available for work right now? If neither of them are available, it's just going to wait. Technically, it's going to start executing some other instructions and come back to it. Um, but eventually, that load is going to get delivered to a port 2 or port 3. And when that happens, that is your 1-byte load or your 4-byte load or your 8-byte load or your 64-byte load. Um, and that's going to go to these load buffers. And load buffers are basically where the processor um, kind of like holds the load contents. And it has 72 entries. There's, uh, there's some good research on like benchmarking these to actually determine if it's truly 72. It is. It's been verified. Um, so the load buffer kind of holds pending transactions. Basically, when you do a load, it's going to allocate an entry in the load buffer and say, hey, I would like to read from this memory at some point. And it's, it's a very, think of this as like an L0 cache. This is all loads have to go through these load buffers. Um, and that's where you start getting to kind of the size things. So the load buffers, I think, are actually 32 bytes. And when we look down here, at the uh, load buffers, um, we'll see that these can be loaded 32 bytes per cycle. They can be populated, but there are two different paths into there. Um, and that means on x86, you can actually perform two loads per cycle. Uh, you can only perform, perform one store per cycle because you only have one lane for those things. Anyways, so the load buffers have already promoted your access to a 32 byte access. Um, and the L1 cache, if we look at the size of those operations, they're 64 bytes. And all of these things are basically to have a cache or page tables or all, like, all of these arbitrary numbers, like why is there 4K pages, why are there 64 byte uh, cache lines, it's due to the complexity of addressing those things. When you say that all cache lines are 64 bytes, you can now divide every address by 64 and that can be your lookup in your cache. So it reduces the amount of entries you need in your cache like lookup table. Um, because anything that's accessing inside of a cache line, a 64-byte cache line, can use the same TLB entry and the same like cache line entry, uh, which saves a lot of space and it simplifies the architecture. So um, effectively, yeah. So the your loads are actually going to be 32 bytes at the load buffer side of things, but the load buffers are going to get filled from the L1 cache, which relies on 64-byte cache lines. And why 64 in particular? It's, this, it's just a friendly number. It, it just happens to be just right. It's not too big. It's not too small. Um, if you make your cache lines too large, then you lose kind of granularity on memory, where you're kind of like over-allocating. You're evicting... like. If your cache can hold 32K and you do a one byte access on a, a bunch of, if you do a one byte access on each 64 byte boundary, you're going to cause all 32K to be read. Um, so the smaller the cache line, the less memory overhead, but the higher the table lookup overhead in the processor. And since all of that is done in silicon, it's, it's very expensive to have smaller cache lines. So that is effectively why the cache lines are that size. Um, and yeah, the processor just fundamentally can't load uh, from anything but the load buffers or the caches. Uh, technically, you can bypass the cache with uncached memory, but it still goes through load buffers, uh, which has some of those same semantics. Um, and I, I think uncached memory still might go through caches. It just might be flagged in a way that it passes through. Um, I don't know. Hope that explained it well. Um, how did he fuzz Android? Uh, what was the setup and which components did he fuzz? I have fuzzed mainly for uh, LPEs in Android, so local privilege escalations, ways of basically getting root uh, on devices, and I fuzzed basically everything. Um, like, that. that's what I did for a few years, and so that's, 
I've dabbled in everything. I've, I've done kernel bugs. I've done custom, like, driver bugs, like a Broadcom driver, like things that are specific to a phone. I've done generic Android things, like bugs in the AOSP itself that affects all Android devices of, like, a certain version range. Um, so I did, for a lot of Android work, I did static analysis where I would just read the code. And then when I would find functions that were too complex for me to like keep the state machine in my head, then I went to go fuzz them. So like today, we ended up fuzzing uh, this function here. But in reality, I would never actually fuzz this function because I can read this entire function, especially when I'm like skimming through code, I can read through this entire function in probably 30 seconds. So I wouldn't spend an hour setting up a fuzzer on a function that I know everything about. Obviously, I can make a mistake when I'm reading code, and I could miss something. Um, and if that happens, that that sucks. But that's that's kind of part of the security research process. You're going to miss stuff. Um, if you didn't miss anything, then you would be the most valuable security researcher ever. Um, so, uh, But for Android, yeah, I did a bunch of live fuzzing. Uh, I've set up like baker's trays of like baker's racks of like phones and like put fans on them and have all of them fuzzing on live targets. Um, I've taken QMU and I've modified it and I've taken live memory dumps of Android devices and I've fuzzed them in memory using snapshot fuzzing. Uh, that's the way I go for pretty much everything now. Um, I pretty much only do snapshot fuzzing anymore. I do some code auditing and snapshot fuzzing because it's just... It's just better in like every way than live fuzzing with some very small exceptions. Um, but yeah, so fuzzing Android, I, I did pretty much everything on there. Um, there's just so much to do. Um, what's the point of worrying about system vulnerabilities as an end user when in reality, nearly every system we use is already compromised uh, at almost every layer? hardware, firmware, or software. So, um, I mean, I don't know what kind of spin you're going for there. If you're going for, like, the everything's backdoored by, like, agencies and whatever at uh, the hardware level, there's really no discourse or argument in there because there's... There, there hasn't been evidence of that. And obviously, if they did it correctly, you wouldn't be able to find it. So there's just nothing to really do there to think about that. Um, so we can't really think about that process. In terms of hardware vulnerabilities, we've never really seen any that are that critical. Obviously, there's like Spectre and Meltdown, but these are doing leaks at like 30 kilobyte rates, 30 kilobytes a second, maybe up to a megasecond if you have some nutty weaponization of those vulnerabilities. Um, at the end of the day, like it takes an hour to find like a, a bug like systematic to well not an hour it takes like a month to find a bug that lets you just map in the entire kernel into your user space address and that allows you to get actual control of execution um so those leaks while valuable and they're side channels and you could use those to maybe get passwords to then off to then actually increase your privs um we don't really see those attacks in the wild and they're just they're too complex they're too slow and the, the results of them vary too much from microarchitecture to microarchitecture. Um, so I just don't think that's really where a lot of people are, are worried. Uh, firmware-wise, there are a lot of firmware bugs. We see that all the time. Um, we just saw them in the, like, the boot ROM on iOS. We see, the, we see bootloader bugs in Android and iOS and, and all sorts of systems all the time. But those bugs typically allow you to bypass code signing or like... Um, cause like modifications to a kernel at load time most firmware bugs are typically physical access and physical access is usually not the biggest boogeyman like if someone's in my house sticking usb sticks into my computer i'm fucked like by that point in time you just like replace my keyboard like you figure out that i use a dos keyboard you then go make a dos keyboard and then you put in a keylogger in here you break into my house at night you rip out my keyboard, you put a new one in there, and then you just take my password. So physical security, um, you just lose, right? If someone's in your house, you just lost. Like, unless you don't use your computers, you just, you lost. 
So I don't really worry about those like hardware and and uh, firmware things. Honestly, I don't really worry about Oday's either because no one's no one's slinging Oday except for you know you'll see that with like WannaCry and those sorts of things, but you never really see worms with Oday's because the people who do malicious things that blatantly and infect everyone um, typically don't have the financial resources or the skills to find those bugs themselves. So they, they basically will worm those things after the bugs go public because they weren't able to find them. But obviously once it's out there, you go ahead and you do it. So, um, but yeah, uh, software level things. I mean, at the end of the day, like people clicking on stupid links is is really the biggest issue and downloading things and, and running them uh, all mods for games like modding for games is pr pretty much all arbitrary code execution like even if it's sandbox games are uh, are not the best at their scripting so like I could give you a wow add-on that would totally get code execution in, in the wow process and pop your computer um, so I think for us common folk uh, O days aren't really a concern. They're they're just not. It, it's it's just stupid and lazy use of computers that gets us at the end of the day. Are you still at Microsoft? Uh, uh, yeah, I am. So I I've been I've been at Microsoft for two years. Yeah, about two years now. How do you suggest I learn binary exploitation? I'm a junior web developer learning JavaScript, and everything you say is kind of going over my head. Uh, I would say a good place to start in binary exploitation would be learning a, a language like C, something that pretty much all the unsafe code is, is written in, something that's so universal and something that's been around for so long that you can um, find plenty of tutorials and guides. I think once you have a good grasp of C, and the syntax is very similar to JavaScript, so you, you might be surprised at how comfortable... Uh, it feels compared to JavaScript. Obviously, there are types and, and other things, um, but it's not too far off. Um, so I would learn C first, and then once you've learned C, I would start looking into some of the basics of uh, security research. So I would look into uh, like stack buffer overflows. I would look at doing some CTFs. If you're not familiar, they're called capture the flag. They're like little hacking challenges. So there are um, one-off challenges where you have to like exploit and find bugs and, and things that were designed to be for beginners and intermediate and advanced. So they're kind of skill grades on the CTF challenges. Um, so going through those gets you a, a good start. Um, honestly, I've seen plenty of people just get into the industry only doing CTFs, and that gave them enough knowledge uh, to, to be where they needed to be. So, you know, that... That works out great. Like CTFs clearly are teaching people the, the adequate skills that they need. Now, I would say at the high level of CTFs where you're competitive, um, those skills start to be slightly different than normal security research. Typically, they go hand in hand, um, but it starts to become kind of a specialization if you want to be like really competitive in CTFs. So I would, I would advise against competitive CTF stuff. I would use it for the learning and the um, kind of that sort of path. Um, so for cache lines, say pointers are four bytes and the line is 32 bytes. Does that mean loading and accessing a structure that has eight bytes of data is the same thing as loading and accessing one that has 32 bytes? Kind of. So technically, yes, but also technically, no. So, um, you are accessing 32 bytes when that occurs, but keep in mind, if you have an eight byte structure, you could have four of those in a 32 byte cache line and that means you could access four different third or four different 8 byte structures with basically no cost because they're touching the same cache line if you had four different 32 byte structures they would be on different cache lines and now you would use more resources cache lines which are very valuable resources um, if you do like high end optimization uh, one of the best things you can do is try to get all of your computation to fit inside of a single um, L1 cache. So the bigger your structures, the the more everything expands, the more L1 you end up using, and then that will cause an issue with basically evicting things to L2 and more expensive accesses. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of the answer. Uh, if you only have one structure, yeah, it doesn't matter uh, either way, but... 
Um, online things, yeah, are going to be a, a really big slowdown. So online accesses are, are pretty catastrophic. But languages will never make online structures unless you explicitly tell them to do those things for you. Um, so, yeah. So we can try and find a different... Um, we could try to find something else to fuzz. Like heart, man, I just, I thought this was going to be a lot more work. <laughs> I mean, I'm not complaining. I'm actually going to commit this in. Um, uh, get status. Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of dev. Uh, I don't know why we have, oh, those are not staged. Why are... Um, why were those included in my repo? That kind of sucks. Uh, I'm just going to clean up my git here and get this commit in here. Um, before I lose this, um, git status, git rm test, test.c, test.o, and we'll do rmf, git status. Okay, so all of those are good. All of those are tracked. We want uh, color.py. We also want simparse, and we want folk 6502 system config. We want test main.s. Um, oops, git add, git status. So I think everything else in here are temporary files. These are all temps. Those are all temporaries. And we need AHT, get add dot dot slash dot dot slash AHT. Um, and full cache. And full IL6502. Man, I haven't checked in things for a long time. Get status. Uh, shot to test I don't need. Uh, get commit am fuzzing for heart bleed on 6502. Okay, so now I have that like archived because I'm sure. I'm sure I'm going to want to go back to this at some point. So, yeah. What is something good to fuzz? Um, we could also go and fix... Um, there's going to be one access in here, one fault, that's accessing a field that we don't fill in. Um, where is it at? Which is preventing us from getting deeper in coverage. There's just one field using that structure... In that else case, I guess, oh, this one right here. Uh, this F005 access here, this is actually not a, a real fault. This is an uninitialized access for a field that we don't set up in our structure. Um, if we take a look at that, that is, it's going to be this sequence number. 0, 2, 4, yeah. So this sequence number, we're going to uh, write this value in just to kind of clean it up and finalize what we were doing. It's, it's good to, uh, and then we know that every bug that we're getting here at this point is, is a real bug in uh, OpenSSL. So set up the um, SSL, that's at F, at F04, we're gonna write in a zero by initializing it to zero, okay. So now we should have more coverage, um, and we shouldn't have any crashes on F. I don't know what that crash is on 1. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, but everything else looks good now, and our coverage should be higher than what we had before. And it's probably pretty much maxed out for coverage. I guess we still don't give it a valid enough packet where it's probably still always crashing in some of these paths. Uh, it looks like it is. So, huh, okay. Well, nevertheless, that was our uh, heartbleed fuzzing. So now we can try and find some other parser that we can uh, build for 6502 and, and give that a go. Uh, what does the output look like when it finds a bug? Uh, that'll just be... Um, I guess we need to SSH in. Um, we'll delete all these, and then we'll uh, run it. So we get a new, all these, we have some like old crashes in here. Okay, so these are all the crashes. So these are the input files. 
Um, so these are the inputs that we need to pass in. So if we passed in a 7, um, if we passed in, this is our, our right out of bounds. And in this case, if we see, um, oops, lower i. So in this case, this right access to right out of bounds, this writes at 4003 out of bounds. And we see it's a one type. And then this is the length. So in this case, it put the length at 65,000 minus 16. We know that that will cause an allocation of 3 plus 16 plus this, uh, which means that it will actually allocate 3 bytes. And then we're going to end up copying for this much, and we end up crashing by writing um, 3 bytes into that uh, allocation, which is out of bounds. So that's effectively what the inputs look like. I could use this input against a, a real... Um, against a real OpenSSL target, and it would be a, a working proof of concept for the vulnerability. So yeah, this, this basically outputs directly proof of concepts. Um, we have like a zero byte one here that says if you pass in a zero byte field, uh, it reads out of bounds on that uh, field itself. So yeah, super straightforward. So yeah. All right, uh, what's like a good parser um, that we could look at? It needs to build for 6502, so it needs to fit in like 32K of RAM. It needs to work with size of int equals two. Like technically, this SSL thing did work with that, but they did have a bug, um, but that's still fine. So something that only uses like malloc and the C routines and uh, free realloc, um, and can fit in 32k of RAM and doesn't do IO. We could also stub out IO if we if we really needed to. Um, so I'm trying to think of like a good fun parser to to fuzz. Um, hmm. I'll just keep that running while we talk. Might as well. So we could go like grab some random PDF parsers. We could try and like find something on GitHub to fuzz. Um, I'm happy with that that heart bleed find. That was good. Okay. Um hmm. What would be good? We could look at CV details again and just try and see if anything like shows up in here. Um we have to be able to get the code. It has to be open source so that we can so that we can uh, uh let's look for RCs. It has to be open source such that we can um, build it with our 6502 compiler because that's the only lifter we have right now. I'll eventually implement lifters for pretty much every architecture, um, but we only have 6502 right now, so we're pretty we're pretty limited. We can't fuzz like a real binary target because nothing's really built for 6502, um, and I don't really want to reverse out a 6502 application right now. So what is like a legendary parsing bug? I know there are some old ones that, like, we can look at, like, the AFL uh, list. Um, so we could take a look at some of the, like, bugs that AFL found early on. Um, let's see. TCP dump. That one would be probably hard. We probably can't get, like, all of TCP dump built uh, in this environment. It, it'd be too big. BPF, kind of, claim AV, Verdair 2. Um, hmm. DCBCZ, what, what is this bug? I got a bunch of new follows. Wow. Uh, Hexy45, thank you for following. Mus Musimo, thank you for following. Vim Programmer, thank you. MJ Skills Z23. Velcron 1000, destroy computers and eat energy. Thank you all for following. Fuzz NTPD, the network time daemon. Um, is there like a specific bug in NTP that, that came out like a while ago? We could look for NTPD. I just don't want to find an ODE. Um... Uh, blah, blah, blah. None of these are... What's an impactful one? Stack buffer overflow. Wow. Wow. Is this... 
Oh, that's NTPQ. So this is like some other implementation of it. Um, I'm not too surprised. The the core like NTPD like bog standard one, much less likely to have bugs. Uh, no pointer deref, which is it actually valid on six five zero two. Um, yep. Hmm. There's nothing here that looks like particularly fun to search for. A lot of these are like logic bugs and not, uh, a lot of them are null DRFs, which are denial of services. So there's not really anything particularly good to kind of fuzz in there. What else? Um, I don't know. I feel like some of these were like super hyped. I remember like a couple super hype bugs coming through WPS supplicant. That'd be kind of fun. Um, QT that's boring. C tags. Ooh, C, C tags. If like C tags is actually relatively small, we could try and build C tags and C tags is not really, uh, not really a ri risky target. Like, if we find something in C tags, it's, it's not not the end of the world. I know I'm like slouching in my chair now. Probably should just sit up instead. It's better for my back. Um. Uh. Okay. Fix a crash with that at end of file. So what was this? This was on OpenBSD's implementation of C tags. Uh, we can go check that out. So OpenBSD GitHub. Let's see how small that project is and how hard that would be to port over to um to port that over to 6502. Uh, so user bin and C tags. If you've never worked with uh, OpenBSD, it's just a pleasure. It's so much nicer to work with than a lot of operating systems. It's a lot cleaner coding styles, a lot more comments. Like look at all these comments and stuff. Love it. So I think C tags, we could pro, oh my God, globals. Oh my God. Yeah, we could, we could probably get C tags built for uh, 6502. As long as they don't assume ints are four bytes, like they don't have a hard coded four somewhere in here, which I would suspect uh, they probably wouldn't do um, they probably wouldn't do that in OpenBSD. Like they, they're pretty good about that. If I look for like size of, size of token, size of attribute. Yeah. They're using size of everywhere, which is nice. So, um, I, I, I would not expect, uh, I wouldn't expect the OpenBSD team to, um, implement, uh, or to hard code fours and stuff. I'm sure, I'm sure they have instances of that, but that's not going to be too common. So let's go clone this. And I probably already have OpenBSD clone. Maybe not. Uh, dir source. Okay, git clone this. OpenBSD. I'm going to take a quick bio break. I'll be right back.
All right. Let's uh let's hop back into it. Let's get this building for uh Let's get this Oh, it's still not checked out yet. Damn it. Hello. Got some water. Get hydrated. Hmm. Once that's checked out, obviously I could grab just that folder, but sometimes it's nice to have everything checked out. Um, there's a chance it failed to check that out. Nah, it, it, it failed, but it's good enough. Uh, C tags. Okay, so really what we're going to want to take a look at, uh, we got the make file. It's just going to build all these things together. I don't know if it's modular. So if I take a look at c.c, this is going to be the C parser, which is obviously the biggest one. This is where like all the meat is. Um, so we can take a look at this. And what does this take? So C entries. Oh, no. Oh, this does get C. Oh, no. We're going to have to implement a like a get C implementation. Stir entry. Skip key, funk entry, C entries. Um, read C in a header files and call the appropriate routines. That is, is that using a global? There must be a global in here. Uh, while get C not equal to EOF. Wow, that's kind of gross. So they got a macro that does a get C on inf. So it looks like everything is based on this INF thing. Input file. And it'll do unget C, skip string. That's in this file. Skip comments, hash entry, okay. Uh, is white, that is, okay. It's white space, uh, function entry, attribute stuff. I think, uh, honestly, this is probably not going to be too hard to port. So let's, uh, we'll just grab this whole file. Any good restaurants near Redmond you should check out? There's a place called Sage's. It's like a rustic Italian place. I, I just love Italian food. Um, I think that's a, an absolute treat. Um, so a, a big fan of Sages. I don't know. Honestly, everything's pretty good. Like, there there isn't much food here that isn't good. Um, so, I, I don't know. Find entries. Uh, looking for structure, if it's that. Yeah, I, do, I just go pretty much anywhere. Everything's pretty solid here. Init. That's going to initialize these white... Uh, white space characters, and that's making maps. Where's the parse routine? So main, pledge, fprintf. Uh, okay, here we do fopen. Here's where we open our input, and then we do find entries on the file name. If not open, we warn. Otherwise. We do a find entries with the file name. This is going to then, I'm guessing this is going to, yeah, it's going to figure out the type of file. If it's a C file, we'll call C entries. So we should be able to just uh, strip this stuff down pretty pretty fast here. Um, so we're going to need to make a, a FOPEN and FREAD and get C implementations that are like kind of custom. Oh, we're at 592 coverage. Nice. Is that everything then? Uh, let me pull down that coverage. I think last time I actually graphed coverage, I didn't pull down the coverage file. So I think we actually didn't color it correctly. So now we've got coverage of everything. Yep, we've got coverage of everything in this function. No surprise. Uh, with the exception of this, which is probably going to be like a failure case on something that probably can't fail. Uh, on write bytes, I think... 
because we don't have uh, LDY, JSR, Story XY, SP. Okay. Not quite sure. Not a big deal. Do you have to re-implement this because we're building on 6.502? Yep. Yep. We're uh, we're basically going to port it over to 6.502 here. So we're going to we're going to nuke everything. Okay. And we can get rid of these and this and this. We're going to copy over that C file directly. Um, and we'll just link with that. So we want the whole C file to build. So this is there's going to be a lot of warnings here. It's going to be a lot of, or well, not warnings, but errors. And we're just going to have to start fixing them up. So um, make file. Here we're going to take in a another application. This will be C.C, .C, or another C file. OK, C tags .h, not found. Um, we can probably grab that header file. That might end up hurting us more than it helps us. So what's this complaining? At 73, line max, undefined symbol line max. Uh, I think line max is uh, 256. Um, So we're just going to throw that up at the top. We're going to say uh, define line max uh, 256. Okay, too many locals. Ooh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, Uh-oh. 60. Too many local variables. Is that due to max token being too large? SP... We could maybe give a different stack size um, in our config. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. If we say, where is stack? Oh, we don't we don't define a stack here. So let's uh, let's trim that down a little bit. Uh, C tags dot h max token max size of a single token. Uh, Fifty. Honestly, like eight's fine. Or uh, like sixteen's fine. Um, we don't we don't need like to, we don't need this to work a hundred percent correct. It can be pretty limited. The same bugs would still exist. Okay, four thirty nine. We have issues now. This is due to line max. So we're gonna set line max to uh, uh thirty two. Okay, code overflows memory area main by that. Okay, so we're just gonna modify, um, gonna modify the make file. We're actually gonna have linker errors because the C tags header should include everything we need. Um, where's the config? We're gonna set the main size to uh, 2,000 now. Just gonna give it a little bit more space. Okay, unresolves, yeah, all over the place. So btk itk wit d flag get line inf so all these we're just gonna have to throw in here um no problem that's easy uh we're just gonna grab those from the uh, main file so main oops uh i guess c tags dot c is probably the name of this file um so we're gonna go figure this one out here's like all these globals we're just gonna we're just gonna grab all these so we'll include c tags.h and we'll whack those in there. And I think uh, implicit int obsolete in 66. Okay, so now we're actually dealing with warner warnings. Um okay, file's not defined. So we have to make file. Um I can probably do uh, stdio.h. Nice. Okay, get line lseek and pf note not found. What is pf note? Let's see if that's in c tags. It is. Perform an enter a node in the tree. Okay, this is tree.c. Okay, here we go. We'll grab tree.c. No problem. And we want our make file. 
bring in tree.c. All right, error, durant. Oh, man. Uh, in tree.c, no error, no durant. Uh, max name len, we'll, uh, we'll set that in c tags. Uh, SBC tags dot H. We'll just hack this one up. Uh, max name len called undefined function warn X. Okay. Uh, we'll implement that here. That takes a string and what's error X. So warn X. And then error, does that return out? Is that supposed to return out? Error, null. I don't know if that exits the application, but we're gonna, we're gonna make that exit. So we're gonna impl both of those. So we'll have an error, which takes up a u size and a pointer, I guess. So we'll do, uh, Void error size t val and a void star pointer and void warn x uh, constant character x. And then we're going to go implement those in our test.c. Um, so we'll implement uh, these two functions. And so warning and error. Warning. I'm guessing is a warning, so that's fine. And then error, that one's gonna, that one we want to, we're just gonna volatile int ox foop food equals zero. And warnings will just do nothing. So errors, we do nothing. Well, we crash on an error and we warn on, okay, so code is overflowing again. Oh, this is getting big. All right, we're getting there. Uh, get line, uh, lseek, and put entries. So I actually don't like pulling in standard io.h. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that that's going to cause us to have, that's gonna bring in functions that we can't rely on correctly. So I'm gonna do that. Uh, 70, so we have some issues on uh, struct file. So we're gonna implement those here. Um, so it doesn't like file and it, yeah, it just doesn't like file. I think that's the only one. So we'll do um, type def struct file and this will be uh, literally nothing. Can, can I do an empty structure? Oh, type def struct under file as file. Multiple definitions of file. Um, Is this pulling in centered? No. Um, it's probably one of these pulls in standard IO and it's probably not happy about it. Yeah, this one limits string, that's fine. Um, we also need to check on the C version. This one, we don't want standard IO. Get rid of it, okay. Okay, now we have what I wanted. So we have a bunch of calls to functions that don't exist. Uh, ftel, get c, eof. Um, what is eof? That's just a like negative one, I think. Get c is not equal to. Oh, that's the actual eof character, which is. Uh, EOF, that is end of file, end of file. Where is it? We can use end of text. Is that technically end of file? We'll just do that. We'll do three. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. We just need to follow the same convention. Um, so we'll do define EOF as three. Okay, now we have undefined functions, ftel, get c, and unget c. So we just have to implement those. Uh, that's easy. So um, 
Let's get the man page for those up. F get C or F or get C. Just takes the stream and returns an int. So int get C file times stream. And then on get C. And what does on get C do? Uh, takes an int C and the stream. On get C, int C and the stream. Okay. And we just need to now define these. We'll define these up here. Boop. And this one. Uh, yep, file. Just got to put them below. Non void, return EOF. Return EOF. On get C. How does it use it? It just uh, casts it to a void. So it doesn't use the return results from that in any situation. Okay, good to know. And then we have FTEL. Um, and I need to keep that man page open. I actually don't know what unget C does. Return C on success EOF on error. Unget C pushes that back to the stream. Casting an unsent character um, where it's available for a subsequent read. Pushback characters will be returned in reverse order. And only one pushback is guaranteed. Okay, only one's guaranteed. I can I can deal with that. And then get C. And I think it's probably going to so F tell is easy. That's just a long um F tell here. Done. And this one will return zero. Uh yep, we need to define it. Okay, we've got FTEL, uh, SN printf. I think that is in standard IO. And fprintf. Where is it using those? I think we can probably nuke that code. I'm guessing this is going to be debug code, like uh, sprintf. PF node, enter, okay. Um, yeah, now we're going to have issues of conflicting file things. Well, that's fine. We'll just get rid of these. And then we'll change. We'll make ours a folk file. And then we'll just change all the instances of that. So we'll go into here. We're going to use file percent s file with bulk file looks good and we have to do that uh, here we don't use it and then I think we use it in here won't we yeah we will and this is now full bulk file of course okay good okay ftel get c on get c good and these will do now we'll include standard io.h again and not compatible with pointer types uh, 59 yep so ftel we're going to implement uh, ftel folk ftel there we go so that's folk ftel we'll have folk on get c and folk get c get C uh on get C with folk on get C okay undefined undefined looks good and then 61 it's not happy and get C and get C is in here and we'll make this uh folk get C and I don't think it actually does a normal get C anywhere so it, it, it uses the uh the handler here uh, 87. Ooh. 
uh, set line. Set line is going to do uh, an FTEL. Okay. Anything else in here? I don't think so. Good, 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 good. Uh, 38. Uh, yeah, we don't need EOF anymore. Undefined symbol EOF. Yep. Uh, include standard IO.h. Okay. And this is. What was it before? Line FTEL. Okay, I think everything's good now. We just need to fix these up in our header. We basically hooked all of the accesses to use our own routines, which should now, we'll be able to implement these in memory. Uh, get line and put entries, okay. Uh, and put entries. Uh, oh, it uses it, get line. Shit. Does it use put entries? No. So we just need uh called on oh it's used in tree. Okay. Put entries, we're gonna have to find where those are implemented. Put entries, we've got print.c. That one looks easy. I think we're fine in print.c. We'll just have to include that in. We're gonna have a couple issues with that. Not a not a huge surprise. Uh, print.c. Okay, incompatible types in print.c. Good. Um, ftel. This is now a folk ftel. And f get c. No, just ftel. Uh, 55. fseek. Falk fseek. Ah. We're going to have to make uh, Falk fseek. And that is a... This... Nice. Okay. This. Ooh. Okay. Nice. Uh, 55. Line FTEL. That takes an INF. Folk FSEEK. Oh, this is a folk file. Out F. Out F. Yep, this is uh, folk F printf. <laughs> We're almost there. That'll do. That'll do. Folk F printf to a folk file. And put this in here. Is that it? Are we done? <sighs> Missing memory area for once. Okay. That means there's some routine in here. There's there's some something in here that's using the once segment. And the once segment is used by... Um, yeah, that's... It's something that needs uh, code execution prior to running. Uh, yep, return zero. Missing area assignment for once. The problem is we can't have something do a, doing a once. I don't know what would be doing that. It's probably a relatively complex operation that would need a once. Maybe like the, maybe some of the like, what C functions does this pull in? 
Maybe Esprintef. Let me see if Esprintef is uh, is doing that to us. So I'll get rid of all of the object files. And we'll see if we have the issue. And we don't. And let's see if we can Esprintef. Car buff. 100 Esprintef buff. Uh, ASDF. Okay, so S printf is fine. What about SN printf? Shouldn't it shouldn't be any different? Maybe if it uses a field. No. Okay. Oh, straight up printf. V flag, X flag. Um. I think the issue will be printf. Yep. So I need to nuke the uses of printf here. Um, if that, otherwise if x flag. Uh, v flag. I think we just get rid of them. It's like printing tags. We just get rid of those. It'll just always print tags to the file or save the tags to the file. Okay. Let's see if that was it. We got a couple more once. Uh, there's probably a printf in here. Mm, there's something else. Let's try and get everything but C. Okay, let's see if it's in print. So print's fine, but tree is not. So there's something in tree. Maybe there's a printf. Uh, yeah, we'll do a... We'll just get rid of that. And this. Bye. If not been warned. I also have to get rid of that. I, I hate, I hate, let me make sure our scopes are fine. We're fine there. And we're fine there. Okay, now we're good there. And let's pull in c.c. .c. Hey, okay, it's built. So now we have a, now we should have a uh, c tags implementation for 6502, obviously it's not gonna work because we haven't implemented any of these things yet, these like file accessors, but that's easy. We're gonna, we're gonna add those pretty quick. Um, I just wanna take a look at the object. We've got test program here and the debug labels. I wanna whack this in Ida and see, uh, see what this is looking like. Um, six five oh two, yes. Okay, and let's get our symbols applied. Okay. So we have our entry. Oh, we're not we're not calling anything. Everything's probably getting optimized out yet, then. Why the VM? I just keep my IDA in a VM. It's just convenient. Um, allows me to like move it around and, and keep it like with all the IDBs and stuff. I also don't uh, want to have internet on uh, on my IDA VMs. I don't I don't like uh, I don't like doing reversing on machines with internet. So. Um, even though I don't think Ida actually sends anything back, I, st I, it's still a, a risk. I just don't, yeah, you don't know if you don't know. So I've just pretty much always run Ida and VMs ever since I started. Um, it's also nice cause I only have the windows version of it and I'm used to running Linux. So it's also nice to have it where you can whack it in a, a windows VM on a Linux machine. Uh, 
All right. So we need to implement all of these. And we also need to parse the file. So let's look at let's look at main here. Uh, not in here. In here. In here. Or er, ctags.c. And we're gonna see what this needs to set up. So there are a couple globals. A flag and U flag are no. Okay, we'll want that. Rigv parsing some stuff, preload entries. Okay, what's in it? Sets up the boolean pseudo functions. Okay, so we'll want a init. We'll grab that, and we're just gonna kind of follow the process that uh, this does. So we're gonna say if that and not that. So we don't have the u flag, so we don't have to worry about that. So we'll call init. We don't have to preload entries because that's not a state that we're actually tracking. It's then going to fopen into inf. And then it's going to do find entries on that. And then it's going to fclose inf. Um, and then... Um, and then if there's head... Okay, then it's going to output everything so we also will need that i think that's all the logic that we actually care about here uh i don't think that's gonna work we're gonna have a couple things missing argv and step uh argv 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 step okay um we'll just say asdf we actually don't want to call f open here so we're gonna make a new structure here so inf um Inf dot pointer is equal to ox e o o. Inf dot len is equal to ox d uh, to zero. Then we're gonna do find entries, and then we're gonna f close. Uh, in this case, we're gonna do okay. So pointer is gonna be equal to malloc uh, inf dot len because I I want to free it as well, just in case this uses something incorrectly. So we'll do. Um, uh, if x flag put entries, otherwise put entries to an output file. So we're going to say there's no output file. We're just going to do put entries. Then here we'll do a free of inf dot pointer. And then we'll define our fake file to have a um, char pointer and a size t len that's going to be our file struct expected 93 yeah 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 uh, folk files uh, or folk file star and we're going to malloc yeah in this case it's a uh, oh what struct expected oh is inf not uh no, that's uh, okay. An inf up here is a folk file. Oh, yeah, uh, okay. Um, and then we'll do inf len is equal to uh, payload length. And we'll do uh, char payload. 256 is going to be initialized to zeros. And then we'll have size t payload length equal to zero. So we'll allocate payload length bytes and then we'll uh, mem copy into inf pointer from payload of payload length and we'll update that payload length. So create the, f the fake file descriptor. Okay. Call to undefined, uh, find entries. Um, oh yeah, that's in this file. Uh, here. Find entries. That's gonna go through, and it's just gonna, we just wanna call C entries. <laughs> We're just gonna fuzz the C parser only. Uh, 103, 
uh, inf pointer, so free that. And then here we're gonna say, um, we're gonna say if inf pointer, if it's null, so if it failed to allocate, return, uh, return out on allocation failure. Because we have a random chance of having all allocations fail. Uh, so we need to, if that pointer is bad, then we return out. Otherwise, we're gonna copy the payload, uh, copy the payload to the heap, parse the file as a C file, and then this is gonna be free the allocation. And this is uh, write out the um, C tags file. Okay, that builds. That's starting to take some time to build. Nice, 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 nice. Okay, so as long as we implement these functions, I think we're fine. So what I can do is in here, we're gonna have a, we'll have the buff and then we'll have pointer. And so here we'll set a point, a buff is equal to that. Buff buff, and then inside we'll do inf pointer is equal to inf buff. Okay. So, now we just have to implement these and not make a mistake, <laughs> uh, which is going to be tough. So, ftel, that's going to return um, stream pointer minus stream buff. That's it. We get the uh, we get the pointer and we subtract off the buffer, so that's our offset into the file. Done. F get C. This is going to um, if uh, size T position is equal to stream pointer minus stream buff. If position is greater than or equal to len. If the offset is equal to that, otherwise we're going to um, return out times stream pointer plus plus. And I'm going to do this because I hate doing the plus plus in one line. We're going to do uh, int ret is equal to this. So we're going to deref that thing. We're going to return ret and then we're going to do stream pointer plus plus. So get our offset. If the position is greater than or equal to the length, um, cause it's an, cause that's a, that, since that's an offset equal to is an end of file. Otherwise we're going to deref that to get the character. And then we're going to increment the pointer, advance the pointer, and then we're going to return out. So that should work. Uh, len, uh, if position is greater than the stream len. Okay, so if it's out of bounds of the input, so we actually probably shouldn't have any out of bounds accesses on that because everything's gonna go through here. Nothing's actually doing pointer arithmetic in this application. This might've been a really stupid target to fuzz. Then we're gonna have unget C here. Uh, so unget C, that's gonna basically push something on here so we'll say um and it said it could it was a uh, depth of one uh on get c push characters are returned in reverse order only one pushback is guaranteed so if there's only one pushback guaranteed then what i can do is i can have a pushback character and i can have push back valid and then here we'll set uh Inf pushback valid is equal to zero. Okay. Then that means for uh, unget C, we're going to do a stream pushback valid is equal to one. Stream pushback uh, character is equal to uh, char C. And then we're going to return zero, success. Uh, on get C returns EOF on error. So we're going to say if pushback valid is, if pushback valid, then 
return EOF. Um, we only support one character pushback. And then this is uh, set up the pushback state. Pushback valid is one, set up the character, return zero on success. Yep, uh, oh, return C on success. Uh, so we'll return C, otherwise EOF. F get C, we're going to return EOF if it's out of bounds. Otherwise we're going to advance the pointer and return ret. Uh, that looks good. And then we're gonna have if pushback valid, then we're going to return a uh, stream pushback character. And we'll do uh, pushback valid is zero. Handle on get C cases. So if the pushback is valid, then we set it to not valid. We return the pushback character. Okay. And then that opens up this state machine again. Uh, 43, 43, 43. Yep. Uh, size T position. Okay, so get C, I think this is correct. If the pushback is valid, then we set it to not valid and we return the pushback character. Otherwise, we'll get our position into the stream. If the position is greater than or equal to the length, then we're out of bounds, so we return EOF. Otherwise, dereference the pointer, advance the pointer and return the, the character. In this case, if the pushback is valid, we return EOF. Otherwise, set the pushback valid to 1. Store the character, return C on success. FTEL, we're just going to get the um, offset that we're currently at in our buffer. So pointer minus that. Unget C. Ooh, I don't know if unget C needs to affect this pointer. I don't know if this FTEL is incorrect in that case. Um... I suspect it might be. Uh, Fseek, uh, this is going to, we need the different whence values. Um, I'm guessing they're only gonna use probably seek set, so let's take a look. Uh, seek set, yep, that's the only one to use. So we're gonna say um, if whence is equal to seek set, otherwise we're going to Crash. Right to uh, fooey. Okay. So if it's seek set, then we'll do stream pointer is equal to stream buff plus offset. So that will just update the index that we're seeked to, and then that returns. What does it return? Uh, return value, if successful, it returns zero. Okay. So we'll fseek, if it's seek set, we handle that. If it's anything else, we don't handle it. Uh, that will set a pointer to be out of bounds. Um, we might need an integer overflow check here. Um, there could be issues there. Then printf, f printf, uh, we just do nothing. That's fine. Okay. Um, so we've got two things. I, I don't know if unget C will adjust uh, the FTEL. I think it might. Um, may not be meaningful, but still be okay. If there are characters being put back using unget c still pending of being read the behavior is undefined yes i love undefined behavior it means i it means it's now correct okay so that's undefined perfect um and fseek this the only thing that i think could be an issue here is if offset causes that pointer to wrap so i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to say if uh Stream buff is less than stream buff plus offset. 
Then we're going to uh, F O O F foof. That's going to be a. So if there's an integer overflow, then we're going to get really unhappy there. And seek set, right? That's the base, I think. Uh, oops, F seek. Well, got it anyways. Seek set, I think is, yeah, the base. Yep. So I think that's correct. We just get the buffer plus the offset. That's fine. This one's fine. Unless technically pointer can wrap there, but it won't in our case. Um, and we never advance the pointer past one character out of bounds. I think, I think we have implemented a, a way of reading and writing files. Okay, so, all right, um, let's take a look at that in Ida. This is probably going to be our final version. So this is probably what we're going to hack on. Let's take a look. This, 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 this. Doop, 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 doop. Okay, and then define at entry. Okay, so we got a lot of code now. Okay, push AX, we have the payload length, so we have symbols for all these things now, that's nice. So that's the payload length field, payload field, perfect. And then that's gonna go in and perform mem copy. Gonna load some addresses here, I guess that's, those are probably in BSS, I'm guessing. Yeah. So this will then call put entries. Put entries is going to go in here. Let me full screen it. Uh, push entries is going to go in here. And what do we got? Uh, Falk F printf. Okay, we don't care about put. En we want C entries. Okay, this is the, there it is. Here's the parser. Okay, looks fun. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't do any pointer arithmetic, so I, I, I don't know like what it would possibly have a corruption bug on. So okay, so we've got that. Now we just need our Rust file to set everything up, allocate room for the heap. Uh, we don't want any of the SSL stuff anymore, and we're going to start at entry which is at OX2000. So we're just gonna enter, we're gonna start execution, and let's see what happens here. Um, tempted to add memory that already exists. Uh, add memory for the entire image. Oh, I need to move the stack. So we'll put the stack at C, or the heap. It now, oh, it was overlapping with the code section. Okay, now this is failing. I uh, can't write to D02. Yeah, this is all of our injection stuff is wrong now. Um, assert the max input size. This was uh, now 256. I'm gonna go down here and generate, mutate. Okay, so we just want to do uh, VM dot mmu dot write force so we want to write in the input online mutate input dot as slice uh, we want to assert that this is equal to mutate input dot len and we want to write to vert adder in this case it's a hard coded where that uh, memory is so uh, where is that at payload length here. And I could actually parse that symbol file so it automatically just update these things. Uh, so write in the input and then we want to write in the length to the actual payload here. So much nicer with symbols. Um, actually we got it backwards. So this is uh, for AF2. 
the first one is that, and then this one is the um, a reference to mutate input dot len as u16, and make sure that's equal to two bytes. So we write in the input, we write in the length, and that should be fuzzing. I think. Okay. Crash there, reading 4B12. Okay. Interesting. Let's take a look. LDA. Oh, it right away, uh, 4B12. Well, that... That's something in the BSS. Why is 4B12? Is there supposed to be something in the BSS at that offset? Let me see if I have a symbol for that. INF. Um... INF, I guess, I uh, oh yeah, I'm, yeah, that should be a pointer, yeah, my code's wrong, okay, um, in here we need to allocate the INF structure, so we'll do that, um, okay, we'll set pushback character, hey, look at that, I found a bug in my own stuff, uh, INF is equal to, uh, folk file star malloc size of folk file, if not inf, return free inf, free inf. So we allocate that folk file and then we fill it in so everything will be initialized. Uh, we gotta rebuild it. Oh, that might change the code size. I might write a parser for that. Uh, well, I can actually look up these labels now pretty fast. So this file has changed. I now know that the, uh, what do we got? We got payload and payload len, I think. Here, there we go. Oh, this is so much nicer. Okay. Okay, I wow, coverage is increasing. There, there was a crash. Um, uh, right to foof. What was foof again? Hey Uzi, how's it going? Foof was foof was an integer overflow. If buff. Or whoops, uh, I did my check wrong here. If this is less than this, so if the addition results in a lesser value, okay, let's double check that these, 4A34, 4B, okay, so those are the same. So I'm curious what some of these crashes are gonna be. Um, Uh, crash there, reading 4BF2. That PC doesn't seem correct. Um, crash here? Oh, oh, I'm on the wrong version. Okay, debug labels, uh, test program. Apply those symbols. Okay. Let's take a look. So we're crashing. We have a crash here. Accessing 4B. Uh, we can actually look at what this is in the symbol table. Um, so it's trying to access head. So it's trying to read that. That's an uninitialized read. And then this one is a X flag. So we just have to fill those in. Um, okay, so we need to fill in some of these flags. 
Um, so everything is checking for uninitialized reads, um, and thus uh, these fields need to be filled in because they're being used in the configuration process. So uh, let's take a better look at kind of the init sequence. So we call init, and we use their init sequence exactly as they do for, for that specific one. So we'll look at c tags.c, which I think I had open already. Okay, we have init, and then this is going to set up, uh, if that condition, then we preload entries, which is not true. Otherwise, we'll try to open the file, we'll try to find entries, we'll close. Um, if x flag, oh, the flags will get set here. So what are we accessing? X flag, and what was the other one? X flag and head. So we'll set X flag. We'll initialize that to zero. And head. This is what is what is this? Uh, head. Head of the sorted binary tree. So who allocates this? Head. If head. Okay. Uh, well, that one checks. Is is this the crash? Oh. I guess BSS is always zeroed out. Um, so that's fine. But basically, this uh, I'm guessing it can get filled in in probably like c.c. Uh, one of these will access head, um, and 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 that's fine. So the this is my stuff being overly strict. So I actually have to relax my stuff by saying these fields are are null. So we're gonna say head is null, um, and this is just due to my code being strict, um, which is good. I want my stuff to fill fail as hard as possible, and it helps me explore and learn like what I'm hitting. So now we have to update payload and payload length. And payload length. Which is always probably going to be 256 bytes added to there, but not always. Okay. Okay, now we have no crashes. Coverage is going up. Wow, these fuzz cases are slow. Okay, we have a couple. We have a right to food. Um, so these are probably other flags. We've got cur file. Okay. And I'm guessing that, is that initialized? Uh, okay, in this case, cur file would be equal to the open of argv step. What step? The last argument is the, the inputs. And then it also, oh, it sets cur file equal to a pointer from the name of the, the string. OK, so um, cur file, we'll say foop.c. So that's the name of the input file. And then we have this out f, the out file. Let's see where that gets set up. Out f on put entries. Oh, if x flag, then that. OK, so we don't have x flag, so we need to set an output file. And. I think I just need to set that up with a, a valid pointer out f for the current output file. And that will come from out file. Uh, what does it do with that uh, out f? So it f prints to there, but we're not actually using that. Um, are we? Yes, we are. Um, 
our implementation calls fault printf on out f. Okay, so we'll do out f is equal to, so we're going to make another one of these. Out f is equal to malloc that. And then we don't actually do anything in our, we don't need to support writes to these things. So we're just going to zero all this stuff out. We'll actually just mem set out f zero size of folk file. So that's now a valid structure. Um, free out f. Okay. Free in f, free, oops, out f, and at the end, free out f. Okay. So we're just going to zero that out. We don't actually use that structure in, in these cases. I guess if we did a, 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 maybe we could do like an f tell on one of those, but it should be fine. Let's take a look here. Um, I'll just add a null check on the pointer in all of these, and I'll have them crash with a uh, if if not stream uh, pointer. Then we'll do this, and we'll uh, we'll do technically technically we could do a but i'm just going to do this so we're going to say if any of these functions are called and pointer is uh null then that's going to fail except for printf where we're just not going to do anything 39 yep got to put that up top okay so that's built load file okay we'll look for payload we'll get these new pointers Ah. Okay. Let's see what happens. So we're probably we're probably going to have crashes of more fields that we don't implement, but that's fine. I don't mind at all. Um there we go. So we got a a, a crash here reading a 10 BB. Okay. We have a food access. What did we make food? What did food mean? Food meant error. That's fine. So we did hit an error path. Um, so these are accessing completely fucked addresses. What is, what is that? What are these? All right. Uh, I'm going to take a quick bio break. I'm going to just have this fuzzer run. Uh, and then we're going to see if there are more fields we have to fill in. Um, I'll be back in a bit. We'll just let this run, then we'll uh, load up coverage and take a look at kind of the results that we get. Uh, let me let me remove the crashes directory on the server. Okay, nice. All right, I'll be back in a bit.
Okay, what did I miss? Anything good? Uh, looks like we're at seven unique crashes. Got a lot of fuzz cases per second. That's good. Still 100,000 fuzz cases per second, which is fantastic. I'm really happy with those numbers. So let's uh, let's grab our program and our labels. We got another crash at uh, 10B8. I don't think there's valid memory there, so I have no idea what that's doing. Go away. There we go. I should probably automate the loading of this in Ida, but, uh, you know, haven't gotten there yet. Okay, so here are quote-unquote unique crashes. So I'm going to keep the fuzzer up and running, and we're going to see. So food, we know that food, this is the error. So this is an error function. So are you running this on a single machine? Yeah, this is just one machine here, one, one little server. Um, then we have a load of 22C0. Whoa. So this is loading, that's loading the address of a, of a, of an instruction. Is that just a coincidence? Why would it be derefing that? And then we see an access at 27C0. We see an access at EC0. We see an access at 46C0. I see like a pattern here. So I'm curious what's going on there. So those are all the same crash. We have one accessing 10B8. 10B8 is just not valid memory at all. Um, and that is on put entries. That is at eight. AX, that comes from load AXSP, AYSP. Oh, uh, oh, it's uh, my printf. My printf is, is bad. My printf is causing a stack on alignment because I'm not handling the arguments. Um, okay, that makes sense. Let's see what our coverage looks like. Um, yeah, my printf, uh, that routine needs to consume those arguments off the stack. Otherwise, it's wrong. So let's check out the coverage file here. Oops. Uh, script file color. So we have gotten past there. Uh, let's take a look. Get line. We've hit like everything in here pretty much, except for this path. What's this? Or a B and E F seek. Okay, so we missed like all of that. Not sure why. We'll figure that out. Um B and E G A X K. There's our like foof and our FOE loads and stores. Those are just error paths. Um, not quite sure what that is yet. So let's look at, uh, I want to take a look at entry. We'll go into kind of the main entry point of the kernel. And then we have our call to our, I'll full screen it. Um, I'll take a look at C entries. Okay. Ida does not think this is a function. It did before. It's in the auto analysis queue. Um, what does it not like in here? This. Jump. Does something jump here? Nothing jumps here. Got some like jump tables here, I'm guessing. I don't know why it doesn't like that as a function here. Killing me, Ida.
Like, I'm able to undefine it, and then I can treat it as a function. And it seems happy about that, but this stuff is just instructions. Hmm. How's it invoked? Yeah, in this case, it's a JSR. It's, like, clean. It's really clean. It was able to do this before. I don't know why it can't for this build. Um, and let's take a double check of our crashes. We have a couple more. Um, I think these are all related. I think these are all corruption due to our printf. So let's fix our printf implementation here. We need to, we need to consume these variable arguments here. Um, so uh, let me do like the uh, VA starts. I always forget the syntax for this shit. Um, yep, we're going to do this. VA start. Yep. And I think VA end, and I think we're good. N. Oh, N is the number. Uh, oh, do we have to parse that to do it correctly? I could just call S printf. I could return sprintf. A format and then VA args. Maybe it allows me to pass the VA args. I don't know if this compiler will have that. I don't know if that's C standard. I don't think it is. Yeah. Um. Shit. Does that mean I need to actually like parse the format string? Folk printf. Um. Who all calls this? How many people use this? Just here, just this one spot, this one spot. Just comment it out. Okay. I'm gonna get rid of that. Yeah, that's the real. That's the real way of solving the problem. Bye. Bye. Problem solved. Yeah. See ya. Nice. Okay. We're going to want to go and add that back in eventually and blah, 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 blah. But right now, we just want to get it working. And we'll see if that fixes our crashes. And I think it will. So we'll remove our crash files. Set up deploy. That has been built. Everything should be good. Perhaps the 6502 module relies on stack tracing. Um, yeah, it might. It's like it, it was able to analyze that function before. Okay, so we do still have crashes of similar types. Um, let me like. Debug labels and test program. Load them up. We'll get this new program loaded. Do, 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 do. This. Okay, so the crash is happening at wherever we had our window open here. So. Yeah, what what is going on here? Load A and put entries. And that's trying to access put entries, put entries. Okay, if head. So head's getting set. Otherwise this would do nothing. Um And C entries should set that up. C entries will set up uh, MLB in C.C. Head is equal. Wait, does no one set that up? No, here it does in tree. Okay, so here it will create uh, a node. Okay. What is it accessing from there? Um, OX220C0. 
So, the problem is the character set is different on, uh, the, the character set will be different, so I don't think these will be ASCII, although these do look like slashes and semis. So, if we look at 20A5, so we're going to see if we can get some repros running just to see, um, see how these behave. So, we'll, uh, we'll go check out that repro. Po. In fact, I'm just going to take C tags from here. We're going to zip it up and we'll uh, scoop it over. C tags dot zip to file in uh, here. Okay. On zip uh, C tags. GC start at C. Please, 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 please. Ah, Durant. No such file or directory. I really? Really? I mean, technically, it's an OpenBSD thing. I could go set up an OpenBSD VM. Um, I don't know. Like, I'm curious if these are real crashes or if I'm, or if I'm doing something wrong. But oh, it's 3F 6D. What's 3F 6D? It could be an uninitialized read. Um, I don't know if it's actually a, a read violation. Well, these are, yeah, these addresses are, are fucked. So... Maybe it's some semantics of my malloc or, or something. I have no idea. Let's take a look. So this is on load AXYSP and put entries. So let's look at put entries. Uh, this function is going to... If node left, then it will put entries node left. Are those, like, uninitialized, these nodes? Like, I didn't touch this code. Those might be real bugs. Um, let's get an OpenBSD VM going. And then we'll be able to build uh, that. Uh, I'll do OpenBSD. I don't know. I already have one. Nope. Uh, Gen 1, 2048, no dynamic memory. Uh, I don't think it'll need internet. 32 gigs. That's a lot. 16. This finish. We'll go grab an OpenBSD. What does the malloc in initialize new blocks do? Uninitialized. So I actually catch uninitialized bugs. So we want uh, 66 six, AMD64. We'll grab uh, CD60. Uh, no, we want install. Okay. Is that done downloading yet? Should be, yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, good. Oops, I hit cancel. Ruined. This here downloads this ply this four cores good. So yeah, I I actually catch uninitialized uh uh I catch uninitialized memory bugs in my uh, emulator. So they are truly uninitialized. Um, let's try auto install. I don't think this has ever worked for me, but we'll try it. It shouldn't need internet. It should be the full ISO. Yeah, it should be the full ISO here. Um, yeah, fine, we'll give it internet access. I, I don't really care. It doesn't matter. Uh, here you go. Have internet. Be happy. Be happy. 
I could do the manual install, but uh, I want to try the auto install. I've, n I've never used that before. Um... Oh, that's actually okay. So that okay, that makes sense. So we will turn off the, um, we'll turn off the internet. In fact, we can just remove the NIC. Um, that is so it can get a configuration file. That makes sense. That's pretty cool. So you can auto install, but it's still like getting a configuration file from the same location that your um, uh, that you got served from. So in this case, open BSD, uh, don, this, non. Um, uh, that, yes, no, 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 yes, that, whole, GPT, no, okay, I guess we'll MBR it, looks good. CD zero, good. Sure, just give me everything. Yes. It'll probably take more time to actually like disable some of those options than just install everything. Uh, can't you play with the crashing input to Ida's box debugger? Um, in this case, I don't actually have a build of this uh, C tags yet, so I would have to do that first. What's the best place to get a pirated version of Ida? I have no idea. I, I didn't even know you could do that. I'm a, I just buy it legitimately. <laughs> there are places you can search. You can also try out Ghidra. Uh, Ghidra is probably going to be the way forward for a lot of reverse engineers who can't do IDA. So I would I would go in the direction of Ghidra, even though right now it's kind of immature. Um, Two or three years from now, like all the game hackers, anyone who can't afford Ida will be using Ghidra. So Ghidra is probably what you'll want to understand anyways, because that's what everyone's going to be using. Um, obviously, right now, everyone uses Ida, but like all the game hackers and stuff are still based on IDBs. Uh, but Ghidra is just, it's just the way to go. Um, obviously, Binary Ninja is still awesome as well, but Binary Ninja is also expensive. So... Binary Ninja is kind of in this like weird gap of like if you can afford if you can't afford Ida you probably can't afford Binja if that makes sense. Um, like I think Binja is like a hundred bucks for users and it's like four hundred bucks for commercial uh, for like the enterprise one and then Ida is like twelve hundred right now. But by the time you can afford $100 software, I feel like you probably can afford the $1,000 software. Like, I know that sounds like that makes no sense, but by the point that you're committing to using real copies of software, um, the $1,000 probably isn't a, a huge hit anymore. But Binja is awesome if you're doing any, like, IL-based things. If you're doing analysis, I would actually use Binja. Um, but I don't do much static analysis, so it's just... I haven't used Binja much. I know all the Binja developers, so I gotta be nice. I, I use it for my I use it for my IL and um, graphing my own IL and kind of using it for those things. But I haven't really integrated it into my traditional workflow yet, which is kind of sad. So I need to I need to learn how to use it. But I don't know. I'm just so used to Ida. I'm so used to uh, Ghidra now. So. Maybe I should have skipped all the X stuff. It's just unzipping. Location of sets. Done. Mountain time in Canada. Perfect. Good to me. This is so cool. It relinks It relinks to make a unique kernel. I fucking love OpenBSD. Man, OpenBSD is so good. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to a halt state. And we'll shut down. And then we'll uh, we'll pop out that ISO. We actually will give internet because I want to have SSH. So we'll add a network adapter default. Okay, boot it up. All right, now we got OpenBSD. 
and hopefully that registers on my network so I can just go to OpenBSD here. Reordering libraries. Oh my god, how cool is this? OpenBSD, man. Probably one of the best best operating systems out there. Um, I have config, uh, putty, uh, dh client hvn0, I have config, okay. Uh, Okay, so it didn't it didn't register with that. I don't remember what my network config is like right now, but we'll just use the IP. Uh, oh, oh yeah, that's not my that's not going that's not bridged. So that's actually not on my LAN. Okay, so now I should be able to go into user source. Oh, I didn't check out the source. Okay, okay. Um, uh, OpenBSD 6.6 .6 source. Are they using Clang now, too? Oh, that's sick. Octeon's using Clang. PPC's using Clang. Wow. Do they really have Clang 8? Oh, my God. That's so cool. When did this come out? When did OpenBSD 6.6 ship? Oh, this 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 is fresh. This is hot off the press. Wow, how cool is that? Yeah. All right. Um, OpenBSD 6.6. .6, the I forget where the source package is. Um, OpenBSD check out source. It might want me to like subversion it. Ah, uh, here we go. This will work. Um. Uh. There will be fetch. Uh, what does it use for getting? I mean, honestly, we can <laughs> we can go we can go the FTP route. FTP this. I'm guessing there's FTP. Fuck yeah. Oh my god, that is the worst mirror I think I've ever seen. We'll use this one. We'll just go to the parent directory and we should have a, a source file here. There we go. Oops. Uh, copy link address. So there's no fetch. Uh, there's no wget. Uh, hopefully I can FTP this one down too, but I don't think this mirror has FTP support. It does not. Uh, rsync. Shit. Uh... Uh, is there not a, a package by default? Huh. I don't know if there is. Uh, let's just, we'll just, this, this will be the fastest way right now. We'll grab the source. Come on. I think my Firefox is about to crash, maybe. Nope, not quite. Okay. And then we'll do a, uh, downloads SCP source into... Uh, 192.168.158.6, uh, root, oh my god, 192.168.158, okay. What? Uh, colon. It's like, why did it not want a password? Okay. Tar XF source. Tar XVF source. Okay. What? Tar XZF. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah OpenBSD is strict about that. Linux has moved away, or GNU's uh, implementation of Tar. This is technically more correct, so I don't really mind. Um. Um. Um, what? I guess maybe it needs to be in user source. Actually, um, OpenBSD on tar, OpenBSD on tar source. Um, 
blah, 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 CVS for checking out the source. We could also do that. Fetching stable. We're just going to, uh, CVS should be on there by default. Actually, CVS is really slow. CVS is really slow. Let's see if I can tar it here. Uh, X, Z, F. We only need one file in here. I, I think these might have absolute paths in them, in these tar balls. So, we'll just get that going. Come on. Okay, and then we'll go we'll go build C tags. Um, and I wonder if there's ASAN support. There probably is now. OpenBSD ASAN. I can't spell. Um Yeah, I don't I don't know if they have support for that. We'll we'll see. Um but these do look like corruption now. We just have these different ones, and it looks like uh, this one's not a real crash. That's one of our like assertions. And then we have two crashes in here. And this is basically saying that it's accessing a, a head node that's uninitialized. Um, like in here, this is derefing. So this is the first deref and put entries. If we go into put entries, that would be node left. Um, and our specific implementation of it is here. Maybe we broke something by by changing the shape of the code. I don't think so. I don't think. Yeah, yeah, we didn't. So, if left, it'll call node left, but it's derefing. It's like just derefing random crap. So push ax. So ax is node. So it pushes node, and then it does a load ax ysp. Um which is going to load AX into AY, I guess. And then uh, then it's going to perform a load. It's going to store A and X there. So this is a pointer to node. And this is derefing left. And for some reason, derefing node left is causing a fault. And that means, like, in this case, it looks uninitialized. Um, there's a chance that we broke something. So, or these are real bugs. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. Um, so since we hacked a lot of things in, my confidence is not 100% yet with these being real bugs. Um, so we'll go into C tags, make, okay, uh, we'll edit C tags uh, vim make file, and then we'll set, uh, or actually C flags is equal to G make. Clean all. Okay, so it will use that. And now we're now we did a debug uh, build, and we'll do uh, LD flags equal to G as well. Okay, so we've now built a, a debug version of it that shouldn't be stripped. Um, okay, so we just need the input files here. So now there might be some character encoding differences between these architectures. And that's where it's going to be, like, really kind of strange. Um, does this have access to Phyland? It does. So we'll, we'll scoop. Um, make dir repro. And then we'll go into repro. And we'll copy uh, user source user.bin c tags c tags c tags dot dot slash c tag okay so we'll scp from phyland.bfa.lk crashes as pleb here uh and we'll make that recursive okay so now i can do dot slash c tags on crashes ox 20 um oops Program exited with one. Oh, did that repro the, um, is there a verbose flag? 
Uh, man, C tags. I want to see the suppressed warning diagnostics, forward searches. Okay. So this is exiting with one, and I'm curious if this is causing that path to get hit. It might be encoding changes, so we might need to write a converter from whatever encoding this architecture uses to our like normal ASCII tables. Um, hmm. Has an index. If an error occurs, greater than one. So that happens on the error, on the invoke invocation of the error. Right? It was error. Um C tags dot C error. I don't know what is the what is that? Is there a way I can turn that on? Formatted error messages. Display to standard output. I want I want to see that error print. And then I'll know like then I'll know that we have the same character uh, layouts. Um and until then I'm just not confident yet in my harness. So I just wanna see those will okay. I think some of these things in the input, uh, xxdi, we've got an af. We do have some like parentheses in there. Um, oh, it might not be parsing that as a C file. It's 20a5 test.c. Okay, so we're gonna do this. C tags crashes test dot C. Hmm. And let's see if I can put. Uh, oh, I'm. Uh, it doesn't matter which C tags I'm using. Uh, crashes test dot. Crash is test dot C. We'll do a GDB. Uh, we need to pass args. Okay. Let's put a, a breakpoint on error. Okay. Error was resolved. Okay, so we're not hitting that error case. So I'm curious if we do have different character encodings. So I could write a converter that would convert all of the character encodings from our ASCII that we know and love to the to whatever character format they use, maybe. Uh, where should I what uh, where should I learn if I want to learn about binary exploitation? I would first start with learning C or like a, an unsafe language. Um, and then I'd go into like CTF challenges, capture the flag challenges. Uh, there are a bunch of them kind of across the board for beginners, for advanced, um, to kind of get people in and, and learning. And you can find so many blogs and videos and people going through those um, and kind of explaining how they work. Okay, so... Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so it's hard to say. I think some of the upper bytes here, I feel like it's probably a different character encoding. We do see parentheses, which I do like to see, but I feel like these AFs maybe have some interesting behavior. So... Hmm. I need to find what the character encoding table is. I, I need to confidently understand what that what that looks like. So we'll look at CC65 source um character maybe uh char map character mapping. Okay. ASCII character map. No translations, encodings are stored as they were typed on the host.
beyond ASCII. Yep, one to one. Okay. So then there are some for others. So we have like, this is like the pet ASCII. Yep, and that looks like kind of what we were seeing. Um, so what is a, what is an AF? AF is AF in that case. I wonder how I switched the character maps. So let's see. RG char map. Character mappings, okay. Pragma, char map. Pragma handling for this, char map. And then that goes to here, which is this. Okay, let's see if we can convert this, maybe. We can, we can hopefully get it to build using the ASCII character mapping hopefully um it looks like you just pull this in and it will set up these character mappings i don't know where i need to put these remap zero no include guard here each care map header may be included many times in a source file okay um how many bugs have you found so far I'm not quite sure yet. Uh, it might be one, um, but we're we're trying to figure out if it's real. So let's hop into let's go into here, and I just want to do a copy. Actually, I want to see what that cur file is, so we can actually look at our entry, our kernel entry point. We'll see that we'll set up a. Uh, there's our malloc. Um, that's storing the character map. I think this LDA uh, OX49FD, I think this is our character map. So that's foop.c. So that is indeed in ASCII. But we also saw too many entries. Um... Hmm. So that uppercased it. That's kind of interesting that that made that uppercase. Um, yeah, this like forced uppercasing of things uh, is a little concerning to me because I feel like this could potentially affect how how things work. So I want I want that to go away. So, and we can look for uh, RGB foop, or foop, oops, uh, strings, test app, uh, test dot PRG. So all the strings are capitalized, which I don't like, because that, that makes me question the translation. So let me see if I can do... Um, include this ASCII character map dot h and then build it. Did that do anything? Yes. Oh, that did. That that did indeed, I think. Cause foop is now lowercase. If I get rid of that comment. So foop is lowercase in there. And in this case, it's cat. Okay, so that did do things. Um, I guess all of these files include C tags. C tags. How do I make sure that everything gets that right away? I guess I'll just manually in all the C files. I want to make sure that's the first thing that's done. Load up that damn character map. I think those are our only C files. Uh, test.c, c.c, okay. So we should have four C files. ASCII character map is the first thing on all of them. 
Okay, now things are lowercase. So that did, that genuinely affected the, the program. Um, so we'll update our symbols here, probably at the same addresses I'm guessing. Yeah, they are, ADB and BDB. Okay, so this might affect uh, the shape of the crashes. So now everything should be using the ASCII character set, hopefully, unless internal functions in these like standard implementations aren't using those mappings, which kind of scares me. So I might get rid of all of the use of the uh, standard libraries and like make sure that I have control of all of those things. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried there uh, about those character encodings. So what am I doing? I want to build this. So that's built. We know that our symbols line up and we can just deploy. Okay. And we removed all the crashes and we'll see the crashes might not happen anymore. Okay, so they're still happening. Uh, cat this. So now it's hard to say if that is still correct or not. We, we changed a couple constants, a couple of globals, um, and maybe changing those constants like really broke everything, but I'm skeptical. Uh, like it, if it's using those defines, I feel like it shouldn't have a way of breaking. Um... Okay, we want to be on this. Arm crashes star. We'll SCP those down. Where's my scoop command? I don't want to type it out again. There we go. Okay, C tags. We'll do dot slash C tags on crashes OX 20 a5 huh so let's see what constants we changed what did we do we set a couple different fields or a couple different constants in um, C tags dot H um I have no idea what the fuck's going on. I don't either yet. Are you using whistle two? I'm not yet. Uh, where's the rust though? It's it's hiding. We actually haven't done much dev today, so the rust hasn't come up much. Um, so that's been kind of tucked, hiding in there. Rust is a language. Uh, rust is a, a programming language, if you're not familiar with it. So we changed a couple of these constants, line max and max name length. And these as well, we we changed. So let's uh, let's make sure that our build in OpenBSD is at parity there. So we're gonna we're gonna hop in and rebuild that um, user source uh, user dot bin c tags. Okay, uh, c flags g ld flags g uh, make clean all install. Okay. So that means we don't need this C tags anymore. We can just use the system C tags. We'll just overwrite the existing one and we'll do this 20 a. Okay. So now we can start debugging. Uh, we'll look at, uh, C tags dot C. Okay. This is gonna be tough without Vim. Is there an edit? Nano, uh, there's definitely not Nano. Edit is a FreeBSD utility, which is actually pretty nice. Um, package add R Vim. Okay. Um, your choice, what do I want? I want the no X11 with Lua, Python, Perl and Python 3. Give me everything except for uh, X11. Hmm. 
It's a, it's a oxidized iron. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it comes with VI by default, but VI is just, like, unusable. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna set up Vim in here. Okay, and we'll do a CP of user local, uh, user local share Vim, Vim set, uh, 81 Vim RC to Vim RC. And we're going to do a couple things. We're going to do set no swap file, set no undo file, set no backup. And we'll set number set cc equals 80. All right. Okay, that's a good looking vim. So vim c tags dot c. And we'll just go down. Uh, you know what? We're also going to set, uh, set shift width equals 4, set Ex um, tab stop equals four. There we go. Even though I think this code base should be eight tabs or tabbed in by eight. So, okay, C entries, uh, C tags are dots. Really? Oh, wow, this doesn't have a recursive C tag support. Okay. Uh, Uh, package add our XC to X. <laughs> no! Exuberant C tags? Did I spell that right? Universal C tags? There we go. Okay, C tag, uh, U C tags? R dot, okay. <laughs> C tags dot C, go to C entries. Okay, print, hit C entries. I know I could use debugger for that, but this is, uh, and we'll just get, uh, where's that make? There we go. Okay, so this is parsing it as a C entries. And so we'll just get all these constants lining up. So vim c tags dot h. So line max. So end line we had 50. We set max token to 16. We did a define line max as 32. Define max name len as 32. So those two, everything else lines up. So I think... Uh, previous definition, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, undef max name len, undef line max. Okay. Um, what do you mean it's redefined in tree? But we undefine it. Oh, max name len. There we go. Okay, uh, this might potentially change how that behaves, and it seems like it doesn't. Hmm. GDB args on... Oops. Break error. Uh, yes, run. I'm confused how we're not hitting that error path. So there's a chance... Maybe this... Uh, maybe this ungets multiple times, and it relies on that behavior. Um. Ooh, one character of pushback is guaranteed, but as long as there's sufficient memory, an effectively infinite amount of pushback is allowed. But that's actually not the case we're hitting, because um, we have a check for that in our code, don't we? So if we had a an unget C, uh, we would see a FO10 crash, which we're not seeing. Okay, what else did we change? What have we hacked up to change here? This is not about the Rust game. Nope. Nope. Rust language, which we're not using right now in this case. We're we're kind of just looking at some C code right now. Unget C. Okay. I'm curious where they're performing differently. Now, maybe there is a size of int thing. Let's see if there are any constant fours. 
Oops. Couple four. Okay. I'm literally just looking for hard coded fours in this code base, and it doesn't seem like there are any. I'm actually really surprised. Um. Is there something that I got rid of that broke the semantics? So, <clears throat> we're crashing in our tree traversal. In, or er, we're crashing in, where at? Put entries. Put entries, that is in print, I think. Yeah. So we're crashing in here because we're accessing uninitialized left node. Let's take a look. Uh, well, this one, this one should just always crash because this one is supposed to be an error path. So the food access, the right to food, should tell us that this is due to a, um. This is due to hitting the error function. So I'm confused how I'm not hitting the error function. Um, I could try and build my example. Head is null. I could try to build this locally and then try it and see, see, if it, see how that behaves. Um, CL start at C. ASCII character map, uh, yeah, so we'll do, uh, we'll actually just make a copy of that file, ASCII character map, we'll put that in our test app folder, and then, um, okay, and we'll just convert all of these to local, or relatives, okay, shoop, doop, doop, uh, it could still be a character mapping thing, and maybe it's just not getting the right things. Okay, unknown pragma, that's fine. Um, character, uh, oops, gvim ascii character map, uh, and we'll just do, uh, if and def, uh, win32, and if. If not fine, so this should ah uh, under one thirty two. Okay, uh, could not pull in uni std dot h, which is true. Where is it getting that? In print. I don't think it needs it. Nice. Okay, entry point not defined. So here we'll say um. If def win32 int main void return zero, and we'll call our kernel entry. Yep, and we need to move that down. End if here and move this to the end. Okay. So. If I did this on one of the crashing files, um, we'll do xxdi of ox uh, 20a5. This is the input. Okay. And that will be payload and payload len. Payload length. And this will be payload. Okay. This is getting an access violation because it's writing to. Ah, uh, let's get uh, debug on here. Odzizo. C dot exe. In token C. What? Is there an underflow?
Okay. I mean, it crashes. <laughs> um, and this is crashing in C entries and actually parsing it. Store C in token. I'm kind of surprised. Let's see if it always crashes. Um, the payload, we'll set the payload to... We'll just set it to like this for now. Let's say it's two bytes. I guess three bytes. No, it, it doesn't matter because we, uh, we don't need a, a null byte on there. So that succeeds, and let's put some prints in here. We'll put a print in. So like our, our crashing input does crash, so that's a, a good sign. And let's see if all of our routines are working correctly in here. Um, uh, pushback valid EOF. I'm going to get C. Those look fine. So I'm not quite sure why that is not behaving the same. Hmm. C dot exe. Okay, I want to add, we're gonna put this print F in here. We're just gonna print F straight to the screen. So now we'll see, this is probably going to be the, um, yeah, so now if we actually make this a valid C file, we'll do like int main return zero. We'll see if it can actually parse that, and this has to be uh, 23. Okay, is that failing? printf putting entries it's not getting there okay isn't that I feel like that should get C tagged we'll, we'll change it to be like this just in case uh, set that to 25 okay uh, we want to make sure that our stuff kind of works at parity so we're gonna we're going to change this payload, all of this stuff. Um, we're going to make this uh, read an actual file. And we're going to tweak this until it works correctly with an actual file. Um, we want it to be at parity with normal C tags output. And then once that is working, uh, then we're going to be convinced that it works. So set head, curve file, x flag. We allocate this output file. And... We never get to the head case in here. So parse the entries, free all the stuff. Looks good. And I'm going to do, OK. So let's see what it's reading. Um, get C of this. <laughs> oh, I'm so used to, I'm so used to Rust. Get C of ret int main okay yep oh and then it seeks back int space that we get that and then it seeks back to and it seeks there. I mean, it looks like that's going through it correctly, ish, maybe. Uh, parse the entries. So what if I did a, I'm gonna write that application on actual um, OpenBSD. We'll use uh, this one here. So I'll do a, a vim, or we can actually cat this out to a file. Maybe I need a new line, I don't, think I do because this is valid C without a new line test.c or echo okay and now I'm going to do c tags on test.c 
and I'm gonna do a, a V. Vim ta or cat tags. Okay, so that worked on C tags test.c. Uh, and V, I think we'll just output to the screen. No, that'll output, okay, what it's doing. So, and cat tags. So this is what we want. And we'll do XXD on uh, test.c. And we do have, we just have a new line at the end. We're going to take these bytes directly. Payload and payload len. This is exactly what we know is being sent in an actual instance. Okay, and then we're going to see if we can get to parity with that. Uh, length. And that's for some reason not... Okay. I'm curious if our, our seeking, if our hooks here are somehow incorrect. Um... Maybe our ftel. No, our ftel looks good. Hey, SSP3XX, thanks for following. There's a bunch of people who have followed. Type Uchin, Herp Derps, Pseudo Kenny, Mercula, Greedy Guy 221. Oops, I did not want to do that. Okay, I think I fixed it. Um, Greedy Guy 221, Tortuga Magica. There's Zol, Zol, Zoid. Man, holy shit, there's been a lot of follows. Oh my god. Damn. I hope you guys are enjoying it. <laughs> Do you have any idea how I'm excited I am to see binary exploitation on the stream? Seems pretty excited. I'm glad. I'm glad. A clone geek? Hell yeah. Welcome, welcome to the party. Yeah, we can uh, we can do some we can do some stuff here. Um, I'm so interested in this field. That's awesome. We'll do this and and just do like this and like this. Yeah, why not? Yeah, we can do that. There you go. All right, so. We've got this application is kind of failing in a in a strange way. <sighs> oh, now I'm gonna get sub notifications for a long time. Okay, so how does this work? Int main. Okay, okay. So let's see if I can. How am I gonna hook that get C? Is there a good way for me to do that? Getsy is not guaranteed to go to disk, so I can't just trace it. Um, I can silence the alerts temporarily. Okay. Um, ah, it's still playing. I I don't I don't actually know how to turn off the uh, alert noises. <laughs> Once I finish my C plus plus, uh, I'm gonna do a. a Nan to Tetris. Ooh, what is that? I've never heard of that. That sounds fun. Okay. So I want to see like what the actual uh, seek and those invocations are in OpenBSD. I know I can do that with LD preload, but that's a that's a big hammer. That is a big hammer. Um, I don't, I don't. There's not even LD preload for uh, OpenBSD because OpenBSD doesn't have dynamic linking. Um, so for some reason, this behaves differently, and I, maybe it's because it's not on Linux. We'll try and, we'll build this for, um, uh, line max redefined. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, undef, and then undef max name len. So I'll undefine those, and we don't have start. That's because this is... Um, if def this, uh, if defined win32 or defined, uh, God, what's a, what's a, what's the Linux define? 
Uh, Linux C define. There's no, yeah, there's no dynamic li linking. Everything's statically linked on, uh, there's like, oh, maybe there is dynamic linking now. Uh, really? Since when? Has it always been that way? For some reason, I thought it always had static linking only. I, I guess I was wrong. Um, course is building a computer uh, from a modern computer from pr first principles. That is awesome. That is so cool. Uh, Unix here. So if if defined or that, I think I think that's valid. Maybe. <laughs> uh, and where is this window at? Here. Yeah. So we can see if this behaves correctly on Linux, a.out. Okay, it has the same output, which is good to see. So I think uh, there's something that we probably do wrong in our implementation, and I, I don't know what it is. For some reason, this doesn't line up with, with the actual binary on the system. And I'm not too surprised because we hacked up a lot um, where was that? Uh, so this is effectively what we want. We want this madfin. And where is this? Okay, we're, we're going to build, uh, we're going to add some prints into here. C tags dot C, C entries. So we know we're going into C entries. Line number is zero. Ooh, does that matter? If I if I had this, um, yeah, C takes out C find entries. So instead of find entries, so what do we have it doing? Let's kind of mimic what we're doing and see if we can break the other one. So we've got our init call at the very start. Uh, then we set up C entries. So let's see if we can just do. Well, we have to open that. And then instead of find entries, we're going to do uh, C entries. We're going to see if that changes it. So this will get rid of the detection of the file type. Where is that in my history? There it is. OK. So that still works. And that should be hitting the, um, the put entries in print.c. So let's go into print.c, and here we'll say like printf hit put entries. And I'm guessing for some reason we're not hitting that. Yeah, hit put entries. Okay. So we need to figure out how these differ. Um, and is it in our reading of the file? So luckily, everything in C tags in the OpenBSD implementation. Um, I think everything goes through here for get C. So what we're going to do is we're going to scope this. And we'll scope that. Or, OK. And C is equal to that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, uh, luckily, they actually have a macro here. Got character this, percent C, new line, close, and C. Int expression. Um, I still need that expression behavior. Uh, character or er, int c equals get c inf. Print the c, and then here we can do uh, c op expression. Hope hopefully. I, I don't think that expands correctly. Um, uh, I think if I get rid of the... Well, here I can do C equals that. Uh, 
Um, I could do maybe this. I I know there's a way to do this. I'm just like, okay. Um, expected expression. Can I not do an expression here? C op expression. And that will expand to that. Yeah, I don't think it's going to like this. It's not going to like this. Okay. And I lost the history. Damn it. Um, this is uh, C is equal to get C inf. Maybe there's a way of doing that. I don't know. I'm, I'm not terribly great with those macros. Okay, what, what have I broken? This. Put another... And this. This should be correct. Yep. Everything should work still. Okay. And I guess I can just look at uh, uh, grep RLI get C. Oh, that's used like everywhere. Get C. Hmm. If dev Linux, yeah. Uh, it's all about assembly and uh, building a processor instruction. That's really cool. Is this like a free course sort of thing? You got a job doing binary exploitation at 18? Yep. Uh, get C. It's not equal to that. Ah, shit. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? How am I going to hack this up? Uh, 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 I got this. I got this. Um... We'll grab ctags.h, and then in here, we're going to call this foop, foop get c, and then we'll do int foop get c file fd. This will return get c of fd. Um, that's not, that's not going to be happy. Uh, duplicate symbol, yeah. So we need to just, uh, we'll put this in another file, sp, uh, spctags.c. We'll just put this at the end. Oops. Okay. And this is uh, int foop get c file times fd. I just want to hook this and see if we're reading the bytes in the same order in the same style. So this should be fine. This should work. This should build. And it should work. Yep, nice. Okay, and int char is equal to, or int chr, printf red character percent c, new line chr, return chr. Okay, so now we have that hooked. Nice. Okay, so, and let's see if, uh, we're actually going to convert this to hex so that we can kind of compare them. Oops, uh, vim, uh, this one. Vim c tags dot c, go down to here. We'll print this as a percent, ox percent dot two x. Okay. Now you want to have like the weird new line kind of behavior there. Red character that EOF. Okay. Looks good. And then in ours, we're going to use the exact same printf format of uh, uh, C tags. Ah. This. Okay. Folk get C. Read character this. Technically, we'll miss the EOF at the end, but I th I think it's fine. I, I don't I'm not too worried about the EOF. I mean, we should we should check. Uh, CHR undefined. Um, this is ret, and then in this case, we'll just put. Uh, uh, I actually want to see the return result, so we're gonna do a int CHR. CHR is equal to this, else. 
10 shift. This will be uh, CHR is equal to EOF. CHR is equal to RET. And then here we have one exit point through everything. Uh, return. Where is RET? Okay, there. CHR. Okay, so this should be at parity. Oh, we got two EOFs. Okay, so that might be an issue. So does everything else line up? Um, it's also, we also might not like set up the right globals. Uh, 7, 4, 60, 60, 6, 1. I, I should just diff these, right? Uh, so we'll grab this. We'll call this uh, uh, GVM good dot text. Okay. Wait. That's not the good one. That's the good one. Let me actually make sure. I, I want to make sure I have the right lines. Okay. Hit put entries. We have that. Good. And hit C entries. Okay. Sweet. Uh, and I'll output this. Then we'll run. We'll build it in C dot, uh, C dot exe, uh, test dot text. test.text, okay, uh, gvim diff good.text test.text. .text. Okay, so there's a difference. Um, okay, so ours returns an extra 29. So at the start of this, there's a 29 at like 13. Uh, line 13, 29 here, for there's only one. But in ours, for some reason, we return out two there. And that happens. Do we unget something? Of uh, percent dot 2x. So we'll, we'll want to hook this one too as well, I'm guessing. Do, 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 do. Uh, I don't need the character map thing open. Okay. Even diff. Okay. So we did an unget C of 29. And. Oh, it didn't unget C there of 60. So let's, let's try and hook those as well. So we'll grab. Uh, Vim C tags dot H. We'll call it foop on get C. It's an int character, I think. On get C. Okay. Vim C dot C. On get C. Foop. Uh, percent S. On uh, get C. This with a foop on get C. Does that build? It won't link. Perfect. Uh, C tags dot C. Okay. Int foop on get C. Int C file times FD. Print F on get C. Of percent. Oh, X percent dot two X. New line C. On get C of C and FD. And return that. Okay, so we'll see how these differ. Okay, so there was an unget C of 6D, and then the next thing that it read, okay, we might need to get the, the I might need to add seek support as well. It might be seeking around. I'm guessing that it probably does a seek here, and I'm guessing that seeks are supposed to clear I bet a seek, uh, a seek clears the, um, 
Undoes any effects of unget C. Oh my god, I bet that's what's happening. Uh, seek. Printf seeking. I bet that's what's happening. We'll get rid of the logging to a file. Seeking. Yeah. Yeah, I got to clear that. Um, okay, so this will do uh, pushback valid is equal to zero. Uh, clear the uh, unget C history. Okay, it's still, it's still not working. <laughs> it's it's still it's still not yet working. Um, printf got a head. Okay. Unget C of that, and then our okay read of six nine. So we'll have it go to here, and we'll grab the output from this. Uh, Gvim good dot text. Okay, that's now what we want. Gvim diff good dot text with test dot text. Uh, unget c. Uh, which one needs to change? Good. I'll change mine. It's easier to change. Uh, unget. We'll call it unget of that. Okay. So they differ down here. So there's a new line, and in this case, it reads another character. Okay, let's get this one up in whistle, just in case it's a line ending thing. Um, so I'll do a uh, GCC star dot C. Dot slash a dot out. Okay. This will log to test dot text. Now we can vim diff those, and we still have the same issue. Okay. So we have an extra read at the end, but that's fine until we figure out this. So this did a read character of a uh, after the new line, which is the end of the file. Then this did a read of 29. So let's check out our seeks. Let's see if our seeks are working correctly here. Uh, we need the other one, this one. Nope, this one. Vim c tags.h seek. Okay, vim c.c seek. Are there no seeks in here? Inf. Where does it use this? Ftel. So in Ftels, we have an Ftel. Unget C, unget C, unget C, unget C, unget C. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, Ftel is the only one we don't have hooked. Uh, printf Ftel. Is this recursive? No. So this is just always zero. Uh, ftel is this line ftel. Unless it's going to another file. I bet it's going to another file for, uh, yeah, that's an LD. Thank you. Ftel is zero, yeah, of course. And in our case, it's also zero. We'll uh, we'll put print. Uh, printf ftel is percent uh, zx stream pointer minus stream buff. Convert it to a size t. Uh, uh, z zd. All right. Let's see what we got. Ftel is zero, of course. Uh, oh, there's another Ftel. Okay, where are these Ftels coming from? There's another one then. So, unget C of that. There's a chance that we're not seeing some get Cs and stuff. That's why I don't like hacking it in. I, I like having like an LD preload. 
Um, on get C. Uh, sudo uh, uh, package add R. Do you use fuzzers to find all your bugs? No, I do a lot of code auditing. Um, fuzzing is kind of like the polish that I'll typically do when I'm finally like at a at a point where um, where I understand the code well enough to like get a good fuzzer in there and harnessed up and, and inject it in. Um, let's see if we have silver searcher ag. Ag. No. Um, rip drip. There we go. RG4. We want to search for on get C. So we replaced all of them in here. We've got a couple in, well, that's our implementation, then in yak. But we shouldn't be hitting the yak code, so that doesn't matter. So we don't care about that. So we hooked all of those. So let's check for get C. So get C. There are, that's the one we hook. None in there. Okay. So that, we should have all of those hooked then. Okay, so then we also want to look for the ftel. Line ftel there. And then we have a couple more in Lisp, Fortran, Yak, and then print. Print is the one we need. I think we probably nerf something in print that matters. Print.c ftel uh, printf ftel is percent z d save ftel I guess this is ld was it lu no it shouldn't be unsigned there we go okay so ftel is that Nice. So we should have uh, a couple more FTELs. FTEL is 11. Ooh. Does unget subtract from that? Does unget. I mean, I can implement that logic. I can basically say that. Uh, it said this was undefined behavior, but we can do on when we unget c uh, decrement the pointer, and then I'll say if stream pointer is less than or equal to stream buff, this is going to be another panic. So if the stream pointer is less than or equal to buff, so it's always greater than buff, then this should fail. Okay, so now ftel is 11. And then we got... Okay, it did parse it. So apparently it, it wants that logic. Let's double check that. Um, if I wasn't mistaken... Uh, successful call to fc clears that and undoes any of the effects. But we're not getting... ftel. Didn't we see that it was undefined? And on get C. Um, discard the pushback characters. Okay. On get C of 29. Huh. I mean, yeah, and then we got the, the one at the end, and then we had the parsed out thing. So... I'm going to uh, re-implement this logic a little bit. Uh, have I ever used R2? Um, have you ever used it? Um, uh, I've heard of it. I've used it a couple times. It's compared to Ida and Binja and Ghidra and like using whatever tools you have at your disposal. It's, it's really not the most usable tool. Um, 
but I don't know. I think it's cool, but I don't think it's practical. And uh, making tools that can do cool things uh, is a lot easier than making tools that do cool things and are very accessible. So, and that, that's not a that's not a huge problem. So I'm gonna get rid of this pushback structure because I'm pretty sure it's always going to push back the. Um, uh, oh, do we need to do that? I mean, it's it's correct now. Let me find a bigger file. So, read character, got ahead. Printf. Okay. So, I mean, we have the exact same output, um, which is cool. That makes me feel a lot better. We're going to set this to 256. And then we're going to set this to 0. And uh, payload length is 0. So, now we're going to see, remove all our crashes. We'll have to rebuild our application. Uh, BSS overflows. Yeah, uh... What has changed? What has changed that makes us like way over? I mean, I can just increase the size, but uh, I'm not sure why, why we're going over now. Oh, once, uh, oh, printf, there's a printf in here somewhere. In, in, oops. We added a printf here. Comment that out. Okay. Go down here. And then I can I can revert that file back to uh, 3000. Okay. That makes a lot more sense. Get our labels. So this is more correct. It's not 100% correct. We don't know. But it's uh, better than what we had. Like what we had before there was was actually just broken 4e97 4b45 okay so we'll see if we got crashes uh 4e97 what is that 4e97 that's the payload oh um i had that initialized in the old one do this now it's in the data section instead of bss i i knew something seemed off when uh when they weren't lined up anymore obviously i could fix that by initializing those fields but this is easier have i given talks at infiltrate i have not uh i plan to this year i haven't really started giving talks until recently or really doing anything publicly until recently Okay, remove all the crashes, and now we're fuzzing. So we'll see if we... Okay, so now we have now we have crashes again. We have this food crash. This is probably the same bug, but this one will hopefully reproduce locally. So let's find that CL command. Build it uh, XXD oh, X28.5, uh, XXDI. And we're going to see if we can get this to repro locally. Uh, this payload, payload length. So this is crashing on an AV on this in token. Uh, and we can't continue past it. So let's let's look at one of these other ones. Um, uh, XXDI. Let's look at one of these. Doop. Okay. Payload. Payload length. 
clean some of these up. Okay. That's also access violation. I don't understand how there's an AV here. Because this is... What's in token? In token... That shouldn't be getting inlined. Like, what... What is it derefing here? So RCX is pointing to something like on the stack. What about racks? Racks is negative. Huh. I'm not sure. Let's see if we can get those repros popping through. Um... I don't know if I have it in my history anymore. It's in there somewhere. There we go. Uh, we'll remove all the crashes. We'll scoop these over. C tags, crashes, 20A5. Hit put entries. Okay, so that... Hmm. So that's behaving differently. Let's try some of the other faults. Okay. That one was fine. Huh. I feel like, uh, man, we must have like some bug in or ramification of the way that we're harnessing this. Uh, what was the job you got at 18? So I started off doing driver development for a while, and then I found uh, I found out I was like doing CTFs and stuff. Um, and there was like a, a local company nearby that was like looking for security researchers. I didn't even know that was a career path at the time. Like I I just did it for fun, and then I found out it was like a, a real thing I could do. Um, and that's, that's kind of where I've been since then. Like that job opened up a bunch of doors because I went to conferences and then I met a bunch of people through there and, and now I feel very cozy. So. Hmm. Okay, let's put our prints back in. Which input was this? This is uh, this one. This one. Okay. So we're going to see if we can get this to behave identically. And if we can't, then I'm going to be sad. Okay. So this is what we want. We're going to add all our prints back in. I'm going to keep this payload. And we'll undo the removal of the prints. We don't need that one, and then we'll replace this payload here. So for some reason, this crashes locally. Um, and that crashes 4114. So let's take a look at 41, followed by a 14, followed by a 7F, followed by a C. Oh, extensions. Oh, oh, it makes so much sense. <laughs> I'm going to finish my homework. Goodbye for now. See you around. Thank you so much. I hope you, I hope you had a blast. So I need to cast the, those to an unsigned character. That makes so much sense. I thought I was. Uh, unget C. We're going to make sure uh, unsigned character. We're going to make sure that every single instance of a ret, except for EOF. So character there. Okay, well, that's getting stuck. Now that's infinitely looping. But hey, we're making progress. <laughs> uh, 41147FC9AB. Uh, red character, that's... 
Um, you know what? I'm going to just have this be... Uh, oh, that does have to be in int. So this will be unsigned character. And then this will be a unsigned character of that. Ooh. Is it doing red character? Ftel, unget of that. Okay. Oh, uh, now that's wrong. Okay. Yeah, here. There we go. So where we set up that character, it needs to be unsigned. And then this is the actual return code. So I was breaking the EOF case in, in that situation. And in this one, EOF is returned in a separate path. Uh, unget C is of that. We can just print the C directly. Okay. Whew. Okay, I think we did it. Um, yep. Yep, looks the same. And this one's hit and put entries, I think. Here we go. Okay, yep, there's foop. Nice. I think we've fixed all the bugs now. So uh, ftel is 10, good, a6, unget of a6, then we get a 411, okay. ftel is 0, uh, 4020 a6. We've got a f in there, and then we've got a couple more and a f at the end. All right. Let's, uh, uh, okay, printf. Let's comment these out and get the label file. There we go. And now we're hacking. Now I expect there will be no crashes because I think this is now correct. Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. Why does it need to be unsigned? So um, basically, if you'd have a character... So internally, I wasn't treating it as unsigned. Um, so, and that meant, so wh when I had a character, in, in my case, the bug is actually in my pushback implementation um, where I have this pushback character that's not unsigned. Ooh, we got crashes. Okay. Son of a bitch. <laughs> like, I don't know if these are eventually gonna turn real. <laughs> We're gonna see. Um, yeah, basically, uh, and I'm actually going to make all of these unsigned. Um, basically, it was getting sign extended to an int, which then caused it to access like negative in a lookup table. Um, so we're making everything unsigned now, just to kind of clean it up. So unsigned character here, and then. Um, then in here, we don't need to do that anymore. But basically, since that was a character, that was getting sign extended to there. So instead of being... Um, so if we did a sign extension in calc, we had like... We saw like a C6 character or something like that. If you then convert that to a quad word, it turns into this, which is a big negative number. Um, well, in this case, it's a small negative number, but it's a big offset. And that would cause it to go out of bounds on some accesses. So changing those to unsigned makes it a lot safer here. So here uh, we perform that conversion. Here, screen pointer. Everything's now unsigned internally. Um, even though the code was correct after our fixes, this is just like extra safety here to make sure we, we really don't fuck that up. Um, okay, we're going to build that. We'll get the labels. It's the same. I don't think it changed. Uh, 4B, 4B, and 4B, 6, 4. Yeah, I don't think the binary even changed there, um, which it, it really shouldn't. So remove all the crashes. Okay. So now these crashes hopefully are real. <laughs> or we have another bug. But hey, I mean, we're, we're compiling a relatively large application um, I mean, it's pretty small, but we're compiling, we're cross compiling an open BSD version of C tags for 6502, um, which is, uh, 
there's a lot of room for for weird bugs there. So we'll do an XXD on. Oh, I need to change the size back in here. So payload. This is going to be uh, 256 is equal to zeros and a payload length of that. That could have potentially caused one of these bugs to show up. So now we're really going to know. Oh, I got to fix my pointers. Labels, load, really? Uh, oh, we didn't build it. And make labels will definitely change. Really? 4B4B, 4C4B. I'm surprised those didn't change. Whoa, 4B64, that's wrong. That one is wrong. Here we go. Four, okay. I should really automate, like, parsing this out of the label file, but, uh... Am I an OpenBSD developer? No, I'm not. Um, how is Rust for regular application development? I tried compiling an application written in Rust, had to pull in like three, yeah. So I don't use any dependencies in my projects, but I have noticed that's a common thing is like people bring in a, a shit ton of dependencies and then it's recursive dependencies. Um, I love it for application development, but I'm willing to put up with a, a bit more bullshit than a lot of people. So, um, I don't know. I think it's fantastic. I think it's an amazing language, and there aren't really many downsides to it. Okay, so we're going to try and do... We're going to try and get this to repro now. So this is payload. Payload length. And I want to see a deref of that food real bad. Son of a bitch. Really? How did that not repro? Unless there's like stack exhaustion. Hmm. Hmm. Unless the character sets change, but I, I don't think they do. So... Payload length, and that is a right access to food, which is basically the error path, and error is hit. Um, oh, allocation failures. Yeah, we're not going to have allocation failures in, in art. Yeah, these allocations are not going to fail. Um, so those are probably an allocation failure. Now we can see what this read access is. Um, okay, so that's that's definitely due to an allocation failure. So are so are these. These might not repro unless we repro the allocations failing as well, because we're simulating uh, a, a random chance of failure on allocations. So payload size or payload length. That one doesn't crash either. Let's get page heap on there to be confident. Uh, G flags I C dot X E plus H P A. Okay, so that is not crashing. I wonder if there's a crash based on a f uh, an allocation failing. So. It doesn't do any malics in C entries, doesn't do any in there. It does some in here. Uh, if that failed, uh, too many entries to sort. Um, so if that allocation failed, then... So let me, I'm gonna try this, arm star. And we're going to see if we get any crashes when we turn off of 
when we turn off allocation failure simulation. So failure, fail, malloc, okay. Random chance of it failing. We're just gonna get rid of this. We're gonna say if that that's just never true. So we're gonna see if we get crashes when we do this. And my, my suspicion is that there's probably a bug due to if a malloc fails. Um, if we don't see any bugs here, I'm guessing this is actually a real bug. It would just require malloc to fail in the right place. Um, yeah, and we haven't seen a crash yet. Yep, no crashes. So I'm guessing that there is probably a bug in C tags, but only if there's like the correct allocation failure path. Um, and we're just we're just not hitting that in this case, I guess. So that's pretty interesting. Let's check out our coverage. Test out program and debug dot labels. Okay. I think that's a real bug in C tags. We just have to inject a, a failure rate into malloc. So, and we, we can just hook that malloc and uh, try it out and see what happens. So, color. Ah, uh, we colored the wrong one. Shit. I got to reopen this. Sorry. This, uh. Mips six or this 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 sim parse. Now you have symbols, and now I just need to get the coverage. There we go. Copy this in, and now we can color this coverage. Okay. Yep, we hit everything except for probably allocation failure paths. Yeah. Yeah, of course, we're not going to hit allocation failure paths anymore because we disabled those. But um, now we can go into C entries. So this is the big parser. Oh, my God. We've got beautiful coverage in here. There's a couple things we miss. Um, bool equal. So if it's equal to uh, 2A, we've never seen that state. I'm sure we will eventually. Um, but yeah, we have like really good coverage actually, um, just a couple things missing here and there. So yeah, coverage is looking solid. I'm sure that will grow a little bit over time. So 2827, is that where it's stuck? Let's see if that's, yeah. So it hasn't gotten past there. Um, Okay. And we mute it up to eight bytes in a 256 byte input. Yeah, we're only getting 2,000 fuzz cases a second. Um, oh, it got stuck. What happened? Oh, there's an infinite loop then. There has to be an infinite loop. We see that the cases get stuck. Oh, okay. So there might be an infinite loop bug. Um, let's see if we can find that. I need to add a timeout. Oh, shit. How am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? That is something I need to support in, in my uh, fuzzer. Because if I don't have a timeout support, then, then we're going to have big issues. Um, I could probably add a block counter. Uh, I could actually add a... I guess it could loop inside. Yeah, I need something on a block. It needs to be on every block. I'll increment a counter, and then I'll have some like, uh, I'll have some threshold there. So we got to go into the JIT. Uh, folk IL or folk IL source IL graph 
so the JIT we'll need to modify, and then IL session. So in IL session, we're going to add another... We actually have an instruction counter, don't we? No, not anymore. Do you have an IL instruction counter? Okay, most recent PC, only valid for MMU faults. Pointer to the instruction table, so we're going to add another one here. This is going to be 6 at offset 30, number of blocks executed, used for timeouts. And this will allow us to uh, stop infinite loops. So, um, and then we'll have a 7OX38 uh, block uh, timeout threshold. And that will be another, uh, we'll put that to like 100. It's going to happen all the time, but that's fine. So at the start of a block, we're going to emit some assembly. And we're going to say, uh, most recent PC. Okay. So at this point, we're going to do asm dot add register racks. Uh, actually, we want this mem. This will do it. Do the trick. Okay, we're going to add with an immediate of one into. Uh, we actually want R fourteen. Where was that? R it's R fifteen. I think is where we have it. There we go. All right. I just needed to double check that that was actually R fifteen. It is R fifteen none and hex O X thirty. And we'll do asm dot compare. The memory, uh, we're going to need to load that value too, son of a bitch. Uh, we're going to do a constant timeout right now. We'll just uh, hard, we'll hard code this timeout. So we're going to say if r15 none ox30 is uh, greater than this, then we'll uh, asm.jump not, asm.jump below mem uh, if it's below we're gonna jump to branch short we'll need a label for this so we'll do uh, yeah let's um, skip timeout is equal to sum or er, format of block time out and I think I just need the block identifier here. I think I call it label block. Okay, block dot zero. Branch short to skip timeout, and then we're gonna say asm dot label skip timeout here. So we're gonna add that. We're gonna compare it with thirty. If it's uh, below thirty, then we're gonna skip. Otherwise, asm dot int three. This should crash. Uh, branch shorts. Okay, we'll pull that in. Branch shorts. Okay. Uh, 338. Jump below. Uh, I think that is the same as jump carry. Is it? JCC XD6. Uh, JC, uh, JB. Yeah, it's the same. Jump if carry. Okay. So, all these are really unhappy because, uh, label's already defined. We'll give, a. we'll have to give an instruction ID here, too. Ah, uh, there should only be one per block. Oh, putting it in the wrong spot. There we go. One per block. Eight. Tab that in. Okay. I was about to say, that made no sense. So every block, it's going to increment a counter. It's then going to see if that counter has passed 30. If it did, it'll crash, and it did. Perfect. So then we're going to do an asm-ret, and an asm.move into reg racks of an immediate. And this is going to be our constant, defining that this was a timeout. So we'll grab uh, this. That's our timeout condition. And then we have to edit. Uh, folk IL source I'll graph mod and 
these are going to be our IL results, and we're going to have a timeout. Uh, VM exited due to a timeout. Okay. Down here, we're going to add a handler for this. And all the ones that were online caused a timeout. Uh, timeout. Simple. And then that, just red. Okay. Uh, 4.15. We just need to handle a timeout here. Uh, we'll just do an aisle result. Timeout is, in this case, nothing nothing to do on a time. Oh, actually, we need to turn them off, don't we? Uh, yeah. Which caused Vim exit, so... Disable those and clear the... Uh, set those as faulted VMs and then permanently disable them. I need to, like, move that code so I don't have so much duplication there. Okay. This should hopefully have timeouts. Obviously, these timeouts are ridiculous. Uh, 30 blocks is way too low. Um, but we shouldn't see uh, stalls. In fact, yeah, our fuzz cases is just going to be insane. Um, so I'm going to set the timeout. Let's see if, uh, if 100,000 blocks is good enough. 100,000 might still be cutting some things off. Um, okay. If it's below that, skip timeout. Otherwise, boop. Okay, so coverage is increasing. I don't think we're hitting too many timeouts. I need statistics of how many of these are exiting due to timeouts. Um, 2879. What did we have before for coverage? We were at 2827. So we have more coverage than ever. And I think uh, we want to log timeout cases. So I'm going to put a print F on here. Print, uh, uh, print timeout. Just so I can see that these are occurring. I just want to see like how how frequently these are happening. Okay, we haven't seen a timeout yet. We've seen a couple. This leads me to believe that my timeout value is uh, reasonable. But I can actually add another zero on there. And then in the timeout case, I actually want to dispatch that as a crash, I think. Uh, somewhere we have a report crashes. And that is if it is an MU fault. So I do want to match. Um, this is our like crash reporting. I want to I want to report timeouts. If it's a timeout, is right address type. Um. Shit. Type 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 type. Um. I need a way to uniquely identify the, the type of these now that I'm reporting different types of crashes. Mm. We have the type field, but that's that's not that's for uh, MMU fault if it's an access type or uh, another. I mean, I could make a fake MMU fault. Uh, I can do code duplication here, but that kind of sucks. Um, that's gonna take a key and a hash. I can use that like a weird address to encode it. Um, I don't know. We'll we'll go with the code duplication for now. Uh, I'll I'll clean it up later. 
So if it is a timeout, then go through each of the VMs. And then in this case, the address is going to be this like magic constant that we're going to have. Um, Python import random hex random dot rand int zero to 64. Okay, this is our uh, this is our special address for timeouts, and that's only going to affect the crash key. In this case, we're going to say the type is a MMU. Uh, where's that at? Uh, Volkl source. I'll graph mod. So in here we have like alignment versus those. So I do need to have the key. Um, and then you fault type unique ID for this. So it's going to show up as an alignment fault in our database, but no one's going to be accessing this thing. Uh, and we did that in the wrong spot. So that's one issue with code duplication. Does he end up doing dumb shit like that? Okay. Then we're going to create a hash. That's going to factor in this. And then also the type. Um, I'm just going to make a special one. Uh, timeout. Um, special case for crash handling. That way the address doesn't even matter. Because this field is a special one. So... Then we're going to look that up, and then we'll copy all this code. I hate code duplication like this. Uh, timeout. We're not even going to PC involved in here. Um, honestly, the hash is just going to be zero. With the type, in this case, it's just type as U128. Uh, and we'll XOR in this. Create a hash for the crash. So we're going to take the type, and then we're going to XOR that. This is going to be our actual key that we use for the crash. Oh, do I not have the PC in the key? That needs to That needs to change. Uh, save off the uh, timing out inputs. Create a thing. We're just going to say, I don't know, just timeout. Like, we're only going to have one. Uh, create a crash file name. We're only going to save one timeout, even though it could be multiple bugs. It's really hard to determine, like, what a, what a timeout is is so that crash key is this none of these things matter false zero zero so we just have that the type which is this as u128 x word with that that's our hash it's a terrible hash but whatever um we're gonna grab uh uh, a couple more bytes there. There we go. Because it's a 128 bit int, so we can do that. Get that. See if the crash folder exists. If it doesn't, then create it and then write out the input for the VM ID. And okay. So this should now save timeouts. Oh my god. Something, something got, something got clobbered. What happened here? Something got clobbered. Jesus. Oh my. Uh, oh, it's not, okay. Unclosed delimiter. Whew. Ah, there we go. Whew. Okay, hash doesn't need to be mutable. So we're going to save one timeout. And we'll see if this actually ends up with a timeout in the real application. That will be 
our first uh, bug, if it is, we set a relatively large timeout. I think we upped it, didn't we? We added another zero. So now it's up a million blocks. So the timeouts are going to be relatively rare now. We did get a food crash. What? How are we getting those now? We got a food crash. Oh, I guess we were probably hitting that timeout, and that was causing us to not hit these. Okay. Ah, is this going to be a... I feel like every time we've tried to repro, they haven't reproed. This time, maybe this will be the one. The dream. I'm skeptical. Payload. Well, we got rid of the... God damn it. I really don't get it. We can try the timeout. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, that one spins. <laughs> oh, that does look like an infinite loop. <laughs> so that repros there. Let's see if it repros on OpenBSD. Uh, we'll grab. Well, there's a ch there's a chance. There's a chance. We'll remove the crashes. We'll go download the crashes. Scoop them over. Tags. Uh, oops. Um, cats crash or Alice crashes. And then we'll do a C tags on crashes timeout. Hmm. Ooh. Is it a bug with me where I have if I unget uh an EOF. I'm guessing I behave strangely when I unget an EOF. Okay. Let's try one of the other ones. Let's try the food. No, that one succeeded. It <sighs> That makes me really question the like character encoding stuff because like this is the exact same application. I don't know how, like, why would this not be reproducing? It's the exact same application. Payload and payload length. Scoop it over. Yeah, I've been saying that. Yeah, it's still C tags. Um, God, why is that not crashing? Like... I feel like it, the only thing that would make sense is character encodings, because it's the exact same program. Like, there's no way that this... Did I undo? Oh, I... I undid my malloc thing. Oh, my God. Did I? I don't think so. Let's try it. Let's see. Let's see. Hmm... Like that, this one got a codex. Like this jumped. Or no, that deref, the bad address. Never mind. Um, they're all accessing at the same location. Okay. Huh. So I, I have this. Okay, so that won't return out. And we got one unique crash, which was a timeout. Maybe I did control Z that. I think there is a legitimate bug. I think there is a legitimate bug if allocations can fail. Like, allocations not failing and character set encodings are the only things that vary at this point. 
So now we're not seeing crashes. We're at 2874 coverage. We're still getting our perf is looking good. We still have timeouts. Um, I have no idea how long that timeout is. A, a, a million blocks. So, so the timeout is not real. That must be a bug with... Uh, This was the timeout. Let's uh, let's see if we can fix this bug while we we're gonna let this fuzzer run. See if it finds any fun coverage. So that's infinitely looping, and it's infinitely looping. I'm guessing due to probably ungetting. Oh, because that's gonna unget into a character. Okay, so this this has to be an int. And then on get, when we do an on get, pushback valid, on get, uh, we want that C to get directly put into here. And then we want to return C as well. Okay, and then here in get C, in the pushback character case, this should be, uh, we don't want that unsigned. I think this is fine. Okay, so that no longer infinitely loops. So we fix that. Is fuzzing easy to parallelize? No, it's extremely difficult to parallelize. Um, snapshot fuzzing is a lot easier to parallelize. Um, and that's why I do snapshot fuzzing. Uh, but traditional fuzzing is, is extremely difficult to parallelize. Um, most applications you just can't run multiple copies of. So you can't... You can't scale things out um, when you can't run them multiple times. So let's double check our signedness. Uh, okay, in this case, pushback valid is equal to zero. Then we get the pushback character directly, and that is lossless. We actually take that int and we just return that back out. If we read from our buffer, it will be unsigned character. If we unget, we will, uh, if pushback is valid, we return EOF. Um, otherwise, make sure we're in bounds, decrement the pointer, set up the pushback state, uh, valid is one, character is C, that's direct, and then we return that out. So I think that is correct now. So we won't see that, um, we won't see a timeout anymore. If we do, it's a, it's a new bug. Um... And this will help our fuzzer performance as well. And we need to update the payload and these things. So we're going to do, here's what we're going to do. We're going to grab that if def down here. If, if that, else, and if, and in this case, 0, and this is 256 and initialized. So now when we end make it, we'll always get the, when we do end make, that will build the 6502 version. That looks good. Okay. All right. Okay, that and this. Okay. Now we're fuzzing. We shouldn't see a timeout either. So I do, I do think there's a real bug. So we're going to go take a look at that. This is snapshot fuzzing. So in snapshot fuzzing, you take basically, you run an application up to some point, you take a snapshot of the memory state and the register state, and then you fuzz from there. And then when the fuzz case is over due to a crash or a timeout, or you returned up from your function or however many reasons you have, in snapshot fuzzing, you then just reload the original memory and register state and continue. And you emulate all the hardware, all of the syscalls, everything that it interacts with outside of the application. And in traditional fuzzing, like AFL is a good example of that, it literally will just dump a bunch of files to disk and then pass those files into an application. Um, and in a lot of situations, applications don't scale. Linux syscalls don't scale. So like doing syscalls on a bunch of different processes will hurt performance. Um, it does like a fork every fuzz case, uh, which really doesn't scale. Um, 
One unique crash. We got a timeout again? It's one byte. Oh, literally a, a hash. XXDI timeout. Does Gita support multiple uh, return values, like multiple return points? I'm not 100% sure on that. So apparently this will crash an OX23. Or this will uh, infinitely loop. I'm skeptical. I feel like this is probably a bug in my, my lifting or uh, my stuff again. It's infinitely looping. And we'll see if that infinitely loops in reality. And I don't think it will. So there's probably another edge case. Um, this... Uh, xxdi test.c, uh, ddif equals test.c, of equals test.g, bs equals 1, count is equal to 1. Uh, xxdi test.g, c tags test.g. Okay, so let's find these printfs, and we're going to put the if def around all of them. If uh, this uh, printf k here, and if I'm handling something incorrectly, I thought I had it right, but I I definitely didn't. Uh, printf one two three k. All of those are. Good, so that's getting stuck. And if we look at how it starts off, we have an ftel of zero, a read character 23, an EOF, an unget of an EOF. Maybe when I unget an EOF, I shouldn't decrement the, the um, ftel case, although we're not seeing another ftel here. So read character this, read character this, unget of that, and then a read character of that. Um, yeah, I think if I unget C, yep. Yep, that's a... Man, I can't believe that edge case matters in, in this case. Uh, so clear the pushback history in that case. So if we do an unget C, if it's an EOF... So if unget C, if you're pushing an EOF, then I don't want to do this. So if C is not equal to an EOF, okay, that is at parity. Jeez, unreal. So picky. I thought that was undefined behavior. So if it were defined behavior, I, I would like have figured out how to implement that correctly. But that one man page said it was undefined, so I just kind of left it be, and it's been kicking our ass ever since. Okay, so we have no crashes. Now we're going to see if there are timeouts. If we get a timeout, once again, maybe we made a mistake. But uh, let's see, FTEL. FTEL, we're just going to return the offset. Yep, perfect. That's always right. FSEQ, clear the pushback history, which is correct. Uh, it's probably only valid if the stream is valid, but whatever. One unique crash. Another timeout? Oh, my God. Please, please be real. <laughs> it's, it's definitely not going to be real. Ah, we might have to just put some more thought into our uh, implementation. I just don't think I'm emulating uh, all of these semantics correctly. Ooh. Uh, oh. Uh, okay. Read, read. I mean, this one looks sane. We don't see any edge cases. I don't see an EOF here. And then it gets stuck. Um, okay. 
Not seeing an EOF here makes me think it's probably not... There's an A8. That could get sign extended, but I it shouldn't be. Um, huh. There's a chance that this is real. That's what I said a million times. <laughs> Remove crashes, star. We're going to scoop them over. Ellis crashes, okay. C tags, timeout. Uh, crashes, timeout. Son of a bitch. How is this different? A8 2028, of 28. Read character that. Oh god, what's my edge case here? They're <laughs> saying there's a chance. No, not with this code. In this case, on get of 28, then it reads 28, then it reads 4-1. <clears throat> and I'm doing 20, 28, I unget 28, and then I read another 4-1. Okay, what happens there? So, unget. If the pushback is valid, return EOF. Maybe, maybe I'm hitting this case. No. Nope. If it's not equal to EOF, then I will decrement the stream pointer, and then I'll set up the pushback state to indicate the character. Then up here, in get C, if the pushback is valid, then I'll set it to not valid. I'll load the character and return out. Um, red character. And then, for some reason, it's getting a 28 again. Is that the subtraction? But, like, we had an issue with that before. Um, is this right? 28, that four ones until ff so this is now correct so like maybe this decrement is not is that really just completely undefined behavior using unget because like this is correct uh, i'll go to c tags.c and i want to do i want to do this print f um, offset is percent LD, and we're going to do a, um, FTEL on FD, and then offset is now, so we're going to see what the deltas are on this, so every time we unget, I, I just want to see what that does to the offset, offset, okay, so that didn't affect it. But didn't we see one where it did? We totally saw one where it did. Read character 4-1. Unget of offset is now 48. So that stayed the same. Like, we, we didn't we see that? Didn't we see where it was, like, off by one? I have no idea. Okay, so let's check out our addresses. I don't I I don't know like what is going on there. I unget is I feel like the semantics just aren't stable. Nope, no timeout yet. Twenty eight hundred coverage. Looking good. 
Perf is coming up. Okay. We haven't seen a crash yet. That is maybe a good sign. <laughs> Twenty eight seventy eight. Coverage is looking normal. Yeah, I could see that subtraction being an issue. Like that made no sense to me, but I, I saw we saw that. If it's not equal to EOF. Hey, we just got a big Nessie. A huge increase in, in coverage. Um We've actually never crossed the three thousand barrier. So I'll be curious if we uh, if we break three thousand, uh, our performance looks pretty good. Seventy five thousand false cases a second, could be better. There's some optimizations I want to add to my JIT to make it a little bit better. Um, let's grab. I need the. I need the symbols and the program. And we're going to copy this over, load them up. What does coverage mean in this con uh, context? Uh, coverage is the amount of instructions, amount of unique instructions I have executed. So more specifically, like unique addresses that I have executed out of. Okay, symbols looks good, analyzed. Okay, and we have Okay, those are those cases. Where is the C entries here? Okay, let's get our coverage file loaded. We're at 2979, more coverage than we've ever seen before. We're also just bite flipping. Like we're we don't we don't have a sophisticated uh, mechanism here. That is, I okay. I had the wrong coverage file, which means this now is is dead. This six five zero two. Load here. Load here. This. Okay. Now this coverage has been updated. Symbols. That color okay so this is all the code that we've hit 2979 still so we're not going to hit the failure cases these are all the three malloc failure cases which we'll never hit um c entries so c entries looks good we have everything colored there except for a couple edge cases here um Hard to say what that is. Got a couple blocks in here we're missing. Couple blocks in here, couple in here. Uh, but it's looking pretty solid for coverage. And I closed the RDP session. Whoops. I guess it wasn't an RDP session. Here we go. Okay, so we're not seeing any crashes anymore. Uh, we're not seeing any timeouts. Um, it looks looks like it's working just fine. So I'm going to add the random chance of a malloc failure. And I think, I think we have real bugs. I think we actually have real bugs here. So we're going to have a 1 in 64 chance of returning failure from a malloc. And we're going to deploy this out. And I, I think we get crashes. I think we actually do. And it looks like... Um, I don't know how that would bubble into these crashes. So we're going to have to basically write a way of simulating these. But yeah, we're, we're seeing these crashes right away. So obviously the food crash, not surprised. Because that we know that there is like... A, there's actually like a check on that on a malloc failure. So let's take a look at 
remove all the crash files, scoop these over. Okay, so we know that we don't get these crashes unless we have, um, we know we're not hitting these crashes unless they are, um, unless we have that chance of uh, malloc failure. So we'll do a, um, what do we want? We're gonna do, so C tags, crashes. That's not gonna crash. Um, so what I wanna do is, I'm just cleaning up some of these files. Okay. So we need a random chance of malloc failure in our implementation here. So if I go to, uh, I guess C tags is up in here. We're gonna look for all occurrences of malloc. Oh my God, there are only two. What a, what a miracle. What an absolute miracle. We're gonna call this Falk Malik. We're gonna look for Calic, not seeing it. Free, we don't really care about freeze. Uh, so, this will no longer build. Um, yep, so we'll grab a ctags.h. Uh, void star falk malloc size t uh, size vim c tags dot c falk malloc size t size and then this will return malloc size for now okay good all right so everything's working just fine there I can get rid of these prints, so we can get some perf. Good, okay. Uh, hit C entries. E, this is in here. Hit C entries, FTEL. Uh, where's the other FTEL? Uh, print dot C, FTEL. Get rid of that, okay. That looks good, and hit put entries. That is in print dot C at the end. Okay, so yeah, nice. So now we're gonna go into C tags dot C and we'll just do if RDTSC mod 64. Actually, we can do RD rand on this machine. I think I can. Else return null. And we did it backwards. Null malloc size. So we'll see. That might not show up. Um, include intrin.h imintrin I actually don't know if already rand yeah where is that imp uh, where is that use the first four bytes and use that as a seed for rand yeah yeah I really need to um already rand Oh, is it already ran uh, step? Fine, we'll do RDTFC. Yeah, I, I should really have the the failure chance there as part of what? I should have that as part of the input. Absolutely. Um, what is RDTFC? Jeez. Intel intrinsics. Let's look at uh, RDTSC. It's a single underscore. 
Should be an imintrin.h. What I bring in. Implicit declaration. Imintrin.h. Hmm. 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 That's annoying. That's annoying. I just wanted a fast random number. Shit. Um. Uh. E random. Uh, char buff one. F read. Uh, buff one one. F D. F close. F D. That'll do. Son of a bitch. Oh, man. Is it, has it been this if statement the whole time? <laughs> Is it the parentheses? There's arc for random? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I should just use that. Yep. No, I, absolutely. I forgot that exists. I don't think it was parens because we were getting the, like, undefined, but whatever. Oops. Okay, arc for random mod 64 is equal to zero. Okay, so... And we just need to do this in a loop. Uh, I don't know. Um, this is KSH, isn't it? Yup. Uh, test up pi. <laughs> Shit. Does anyone know how to do an infinite loop in, in KSH? I misspelled the symbol too. Oh god. So this would eventually fail if I put in a hot loop. Uh, add our... You know what? Fuck it. Um, <laughs> include standardlib.h int main void while uh, for... I'm so used to not having to put the parentheses in uh, if statements anymore. Uh, system c tags. You know where this is going. You know where this is going. That does the trick. Segfaults. Nice. Nice. That's what I like to see. Uh, user bin C tags. What is up? See you later, kids. C tags that core. Oh, yeah. Set this assembly flavor intel. Derefin, we're comparing RDI, X10, uh, X RDI. That is a null deref. Woo! <laughs> Wild tree do exec. Oh, wow. That's like basically the same as bash. I actually don't know bash scripting either, so. Ele uh, 11 unique crashes. I think they're all the same. We have one that's kind of different. So, yeah, there is a. There's a crash there. There is an actual bug there. Um, let's see if I can get some... Uh, uh, does D message have... Uh, I, just, I just want it to print out the faulting address. I want to see if it ever crashes at a different address. But hey, our fuzzer is absolutely working. Um, uh, OX... 3FCB. Okay, this one. We're going to try and look at this. <laughs> Oops. Uh, GCTest.C. Look at that. How cool is that? How cool is that? Um... Oops, got those backwards. Man, my history is all broken now. 
That's the one I want. So in this case, RDI is zero. So we've only seen a null deref variant, and I'm kind of interested to see if there will be another variant. Um, let's uh, let's modify. What are the flags for ASAN? Uh, Clang. Um, F sanitizer equal to ASAN. What is the what is the thing? ASAN, 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 ASAN. Do, do, do. I don't want chromium. I just want this and what? Do you symbolize? Okay, building, f sanitize address. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Start at C. Shit. Shit. Uh, open BSD defense. <sighs> Fuck, we'll implement our own page heap. Holy shit. Um, okay. Uh, C tags dot C. Okay. So when we actually do a malloc, we'll get a. Uh, pointer is equal to this. We'll do a mem set of pointer with CO with uh, size. Return pointer. So this is just a temporary. I want to see if this changes how it crashes. Um, whoa, what is that? That's something else. Who cares about that? I'm going to run this. Get some core dumps. Looks good. Check them out. Looks the same. Um, okay, so... <laughs> Home Depot <laughs> electric fences. Okay, so we're going to do... Uh, when a malloc is called, we're going to do an mmap of null for size with uh, prot read or prot write. FD is negative 1. Offset is 0. Okay, and then I'm going to do a pointer. The actual pointer we're going to return is going to be... Uh, we want to slide it to the end of the page. And I don't think alignment's going to matter. Uh, so we're going to slide all the way to the end of the page. Uh, and we'll fill with C0s as well. So we'll do um, size T page size is going to be equal to size plus OXFFFF and not OX uh, and so page align up page align up the add uh, page size page align up the size so add that and that um, and then we'll handle uh, if size is equal to zero then we'll say uh, size is equal to one so this will be um, ensure at least one byte. So if the size is equal to zero, size is equal to one, get the page size, round it up. So that would cause it to then mask down. That would be a thousand hex. This will be page size. Um, in my BSD vim, can I do set back round equals dark? There you go. Um, mmap null. If that fails, uh, if not pointer, then we're gonna do a um, built-in trap. So we're gonna fail hard in that case. So we'll align up to the page size, and then we're gonna mem set the pointer for page size. So uh, fill in the memory with OXC zeros. Then we're going to return, instead of pointer, we're going to return pointer plus the uh, page size minus size. Yeah. That will add, so 
return a pointer at the end of the page. Brilliant. Obviously, this is going to fail on... Uh, yep. So we need include sysmman.h and mmap. That is... Oh, I missed an arg. Uh, prot read, prot write, and then we need the uh, flags, which are uh, map private and map anon. Okay, that's not going to work because free is bad, so we now have to hook uh, uh, falk free void times pointer. And okay, we'll go into sp uh, c tags dot h folk free then we rg for things that call free son of a bitch okay tree dot c these will call folk free instead Okay, so that just won't call free. So these should now work. So this will work in theory, okay. Now I just need to implement free. Uh, so in the case of a free, we're gonna align the pointer down. So if not pointer return. Otherwise, uh, print f want to free percent p pointer i just want to see if that looks sane ish um i guess those probably aren't hitting free so c tags test dot c uh oh uh oh okay tags why am I not seeing the print there? Want to free. And map that. Let's make sure we're hitting this. Malik. Malik, okay. Is it not freeing it? I, am I doing something stupid? Free. Folk free. Huh. Is it is it leaking? Well, then I guess I'll put a built-in trap there. Okay. GDB uh user bin c tag c tags dot core it's an ipc same thing null dref don't i return null so there's basically not a null check oh it's yeah it's just a null dref it's a null DRF, and then on the 6502, that is a valid address. So it shows up in, like, really weird ways. Okay. Seems to work. 2936 coverage. That looks good. All right. That's all it is. It's just a null DRF. We can look at the stack trace. Um... So it's it's not that big of a deal. Fuzzing on a system with a null page is a dumb idea. Um, so, uh, where are my symbols? Where are my symbols at? Maybe if I use LLDB. Oh, there's no LDB. Where where are my symbols? Dwarf error. R wrong version and compilation unit. Uh, 
Uh, maybe I can do dash G GDB. Oh my God. What is going on here? I could, uh, let me set CC equals GCC for that legacy life. What on earth? Exec files newer than core. Yep, of course. A dot out. There's our crash. Here we go. What is going on? Wrong version and compilation in module ld.so. Uh, okay. Um, static. Static. Is it complaining now? Nope. Nope. Uh, G static. Oops. A dot out. Generate the new core dumps. Check it out. Core was generated by C tags. And for some reason, symbols don't work. So file doesn't tell you on um, on OpenBSD, sadly, or on BSD. So I mean, it's not complaining anymore, but ten. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, 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 uh-huh. That, that, that typically is not a good sign. Um, usually that's not good. S is that with GCC? What if I just try, uh, Clang? Build it with Clang. Oh, yep, now we have to regenerate the core dump. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Ah, uh, indeed. Yes, those those don't look like good addresses. I I agree. Is that only with static? Is static broken here? Wrong version compilation unit header. Um, what? Like C tags works with static, but w when it when it's built static. It executes an arbitrary, uh, that was an old one. Oops. Gotta run it. Gotta run it. Gotta get my new core. There we go. So apparently, statically linked, this bug is, uh, d different. Slightly. What is this? Oh my god. Yep, that's 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 a bot right there. That's a bot. Uh, 
you're running a dot out to generate the core, but then running TWC tags. Yeah, a dot out is just a test wrapper, um, that just uh, runs C tags on this file in a loop. So, what is this? Like, it doesn't always happen. So if I do this, if I change my test.c, we're going to have it look, it's going to do a C tags on test.c. Uh, GCC test.c, a dot out. I guess it's, I guess it just pretty much always can crash depending on the allocator state. But it just fails so much worse. Let me see if that's my custom allocator. Uh, let's see if it works. User bin C tags on test.c. Yeah, sometimes it works. Cat tags. Looks fine. So it is truly the, the allocation failures. And then for some reason, that null deref turns into a pretty big deal but only in a static build. I mean, I can go back to not using a custom thing here, malloc size. So we'll use, we'll just return, we'll use the normal malloc. A dot out. Um. Just got to find that in GDB. Yeah. Like, that's... That's gone. Uh, info map. What is what is the way of getting maps? Oh, it probably doesn't work on... Uh, GDB get maps. I don't think it works on OpenBSD. Is it proc maps? Info proc maps. Info files. Extend I PC. Uh, F O. Yeah, it's. That's out of bounds. Maybe that's a core dump generation bug. Let's check out. Let's see if, uh, if RDI, RDI is zero. I think it's a core dump generation bug. Um, with statics. So there's probably a bug when you when you generate a core dump uh, built on a static file. Um, how do you get symbols? How do you get symbols in 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 OpenBSD now? Can you not? GDB. Uh. C tags. BP main. Break main. Run. Did they like completely break debugging? Or is there something I have to turn off? There's got to be some bug. Like, those core dumps aren't right. I could get LDB. This will fix the problem. Yeah. I mean, the GDB is ancient. If, if you guys aren't familiar with uh, OpenBSD, they have an old version of GDB because GDB switched from a GPLv2 to a GPLv3, which is incompatible with the BSD license. Um, so their GCC and GDBs are from like 2006, and they legally cannot update them. Yeah, look at that. Copyright 2004. GDB 6.3. GCC, copyright 2007, 4.2.1. What a shame. What a shame. Ah, 
how do you how do you do breakpoints? <laughs> I don't know LDB at all. Come on. Break. Okay. Uh Filled the runner debug process. Run. That works great. Um, process launch. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that works fantastic. Um, Maybe I can get a later GDB. Yeah. Um, where did that go to? User bin GDB? Uh, where is GDB? User share bin? User local bin GDB? BR set main. Well, I can't start it, sadly. Otherwise, I would. Unless unless this is not how you run GD, uh, LODB. But I'm guessing... I'm guessing I can give a path to a program. Uh, oh, we can give it a core file. See if it does that. Oh! Okay. Let's get a new core. Oh my god. I, ju I just want a debug. Like that? Yep. So I can get... Wait, how did that get symbols? That is in libc. Okay. Oh, does this automatically get stripped by inst- Oh, does install strip it? I swear to god. I swear to god. User bin. Oh, no. User source. User.bin. C tags. I bet install is, is is stripping those. That's what's happening. That's for sure what is happening. Yep. Son of a bitch. Uh, so we'll run user source sbin. I was trying to get classy, but yeah, it's definitely getting stripped when it gets installed. Uh, User.bin c tags, c tags. GC test. Dot C, A dot out. Okay, we got some crashes. GDB uh, user source user dot bin. C tags. C tags. C tags dot core. There we go. Null DRF. So in PF note, tree uh, C60. See, that wasn't too hard. Okay, so the bug is here. It's a null DRF on put entries, which is coming from tree.c. And if we go to line 60, it's NP put entries head. Oh. -ho! I see. So if the allocation failed, otherwise it's probably going to propagate that in the current part of the tree. Yeah, it it's trying to it's trying to walk a tree and there's there's an old pointer in there. Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. All right. Well, I mean that's a bug. We'll report that. Why not? I mean it's not a security bug. I wasn't really expecting to find a security bug cuz they use seeks. If they used if they read the entire file and then did like pointer stuff i could see that but there's just no way to really introduce corruption um unless you have a bug like in your your table implementation but yeah it's just uh we have those two bugs um 
And one is we've got this error here. So sweet. All right. Well, I think I'm going to wrap up the stream there. It was super fun. Uh, I'm going to make some dinner. It's getting up a little bit late, so I'm pretty starving. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hope you had fun. Uh, this, was a, this was a blast for a stream. Uh, we did a lot of cool things here. So see you all around.